This episode of America Fog of War is brought to you by Civil War Trails. Civil War Trails is the world's largest open-air museum, with over 1,300 sites to explore across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle past Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote artillery positions. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure today. The guest on this debrief episode is one of our favorites we've had on the show so far. He spent over 40 years in political and government affairs, a career that's included work with the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as the former chair of that organization and is currently an acting board member. He is the author of A Civil War Captain and His Lady, Love, Courtship, and Combat from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg Campaign, a book in which, through a collection of letters, he tells the very personal story of how the war affected a Union soldier and the young woman who would eventually become his wife. In this episode, we talk about the more personal experiences Civil War soldiers encounter while serving in combat, and through a multitude of examples, we look at how those experiences are similar to those soldiers serving currently still face while at war. This is our conversation with Gene Barr. I am Colby Sumner, and this is America, Fog of War. Pride of Ozzy. This day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic. Men's souls will be shaken to the violences of... The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender. What was your favorite battlefield as a kid? Like, what kind of got you into the well, it, Civil War? It was it was Gettysburg, which is the answer that most people will give you. And it was a trip that we did uh, with my uh, uh, older boys class at the church outside Philadelphia. And it was, see, I think I was 11 years old. So I have now been involved and interested in Civil War history, particularly Gettysburg, for 55-plus um, years and that's the one that does it. When you talk to people, many times that's, it's oh, yeah, Gettysburg. it was Gettysburg. It was Gettysburg because yeah. it's it's relatively near to a lot of population centers. People come in. they It grabs you even for people who don't have, have a real understanding of it because, let's be honest, particularly 50, 60 years ago, it was much more commercialized and, you know, it was a lot of T-shirt shops right. and you buy the cheap hats and everything And it's and definitely the else. most popular one. I mean, absolutely, and that's for a multitude of reasons. One, because it's the most costly battle that we have as Correct. Americans. And secondly, the Gettysburg Address. Like, there's another aspect it to is. the whole battle that makes it live beyond just a, a conflict, you know, a, during war or a battle during a conflict. I, I um, And it's beautiful. There is something special about this town. And it's it not is. just the battlefield. It's the it town is. as well. There's just something special about this place. And I, I try to articulate that to people constantly, and I can never find the right way to describe what makes Gettysburg so special. But uh, I don't know either. It's something here that grabs you in, and it's obviously and – and you make a great point. It's not just the battle. It's, it's the Gettysburg Address, which is really, if you think about it, that along with his second inaugural was Lincoln's strategic plan for his for his second uh, four year term. But it's also the thing that brought other people here. Think about it. Dwight Eisenhower was here. Eisenhower was was uh, captured by this place, and it was the only place he and his wife ever owned because of his military service. So it's it's not just that. It's other people in addition to us, in addition to all the people listening today who've been captured over that 160-year period. It is. It's fascinating to me how a place can have such a special feeling to it when you get there. For me, my whole life I've been interested in specifically American war history, and, and my entryway into the subject was World War II. I, mm-hmm. I as a kid, I, I don't John Wayne movies and all that <laughs> stuff, I just fell in love with World War II. But from that, especially as I got older and more into it, 
my interest started going into other wars. And I would have to say that my, you know, it now the one that rivals World War II is, is most definitely the Civil War. Mm-hmm. I find, like, if I were to have, like, you know, a lot of the times when you go for a doctorate in history, you got to pick two subjects to cover um, uh, to get to, to, to pass with a degree. Those, those would be my two, World War II and the Civil War. And like I would mentioned before at Vicksburg, um, my grandmother and I used to take road trips out to Oklahoma every summer. And we would, you know, from Florida. So we would stop at Vicksburg on the way out and then stop at Vicksburg on the way back. And I would always, you know, I'd have a little toy gun and I'd always go place soldier out there mm-hmm. in the, in the, you know, in parts of the woods and stuff that weren't really near monuments, just on the sides of the road. They'll have those big ravines that dip off. You feel like you're in a trench kind of. And um, I just found... Even at Vicksburg, which Vicksburg is amazing, but it's definitely not like here. It's definitely not not the same kind of feeling when you, if anything, Vicksburg weirdly gives me a very uh, somber feeling when I go there. Instead of like an inspired kind of feeling, I I, I feel it feels very ominous almost. It is. It's, um, I went there as part of the research for my book. I I find when you stand on the, where the Union troops advance, it's intimidating. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you, a lot of words you can use, you've used a number I think are appropriate. It's somber, it's sobering, it's intimidating. It's all of those things. And when you think about what happened there, the people, the citizens, the civilians who were penned in there from basically mid-May until July 4th, mm-hmm. um, you, you think about what, what they went through. And you think about not just those who are penned in, but you think about the Union soldiers outside who function for six, seven weeks without any shelter whatsoever, in most cases under constant fear of sharpshooting. It was difficult period, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that has imbued Vicksburg with, with that attitude or that feeling. How much time did you spend there when you were writing your book? Just a day, unfortunately. Day. I would love to go back. I went in, and uh, I was at a conference up the road a little, so I flew in a day early because I did all the research for my book on my own. I wanted to. I thought that was critical. I wanted to make sure that the book was correct. And so the guy who I ran into was a guy named Terry Winchell, who was then, I guess, Terry was the historian at Vicksburg. It turns out he's a Western PA guy. I go in, and there's all nice. this Penn State and Pittsburgh Steelers stuff hanging all over. Could not have been more helpful. Terry is, along with Ed Bars, of course, the, the foremost, in my view, the foremost experts on the Battle of Vicksburg. So spent a day, drove around as much as I could, got into their archives, and then did a little more corresponding with him, but would love to go back at some point because there's still more I'd love to see. Oh, man. So I didn't read the book, but I did search the World Wide Web, and I saw that it said uh, it was like Cold Mountain from the Northern Perspective. Yes. And uh, I love Cold Mountain. I've watched that movie with my wife. We're high school sweethearts, and we have four kids together. And uh, she was there along with me while I was in the Marine Corps the entire the time. time. Okay. The yeah, whole time. She was right. there. And so things like your book is something that would be interesting to me because it's something that I kind of lived through myself. It's yeah. a, a similar experience to what you probably wrote about in your book. So it's something I want to read. Well, it is. It's a story of a guy. Basically, the book and the reason I said Cold Mountain from the Northern Perspective, one, I was some point everyone wants to make a movie out of their book. Sure, Maybe right. somebody see that. Right. Uh, it also helps sell it as a hook to the publisher. It was it was published by Savas Beatty, and you know, they're they're really good to do a great job. But at at its core, the book is a Civil War courtship, Victorian courtship, told through letters of a guy who left, who who met this woman shortly after enlisting in May of April of sixty one. In May, went to Peoria, met this woman. Um, there was a nine-year, eight-year age gap between them, and then left her for 18 months uh, before he had a chance to come back. It's a long uh, time. It's a long mm-hmm. time, and you guys know that. You guys were both over. You know how that works with your family, and here's a case where they're in the same country but still physically separated for a long period of time. Yeah, they might as well be millions of miles apart because well that's what it feels exactly. like. It's fascinating to me that – There are so many, especially after having done guided tours and stuff, like in the more and more you read, especially the firsthand accounts of the war and and the the troops' perspectives or different people like living in that time's perspective, it's wild to me how much of it is so similar to what you still experience today. I mean, as far as how the military works, your personal lives, like having to Mm -hmm. say goodbye to the, you know, the women in your life or the, or the, your family, all of, all of those things stand out, but I'm, even more so excited, though, that the topic that we're going to be talking about today is is from that era because it's through letters. And I don't, I didn't realize this until I had gone to boot camp. But there is a special quality to letters as well. You communicate differently. 
it's a lot more poetic and you seem to have a lot more profound thoughts throughout the the course of the conversation than you would if you were just recording tapes of phone calls or something like you would nowadays. I actually have uh, stacks of letters. And they're, they're bound in, in, in ropes and stuff or whatever. Wow. And they're, they're decorations in the house, like up on shelves. It's wow. just tons yeah. of letters that we've I, written. I think, you know, the big the big Ziploc bags. Yes. That I, have, the big, I have like three of them full <laughs> to yeah. the brim of letters. Right. And um, they they mean so much. As a, as, as a guy in the military, you know, writing and receiving letters, when you, when you get a letter... It wouldn't be at the same level to compare it to Christmas because it's even more so than that. You feel much more special when you get a letter than you do when you get a present on Christmas. I don't know. Beyond I don't know why that is. It 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 like soothes something inside of you in a way that nothing else is going to if you're in a crappy situation. And um and then when you you know you have the weeks where you don't get a letter, it's heartbreaking. And uh, I've had people ask you know when I read other history books from the, the Civil War era and there's letters from soldiers you know they ask how I wonder how those letters make it well they're very special to yes. those people yes. they're probably holding that as close as they do their Bible or or anything in the same category it's it's a very special personal connection to the life they still have back at home um, how old were the were the because uh, it's Joseph and Jenny Josiah and Josiah, Jenny mm-hmm. Josiah and Jenny yes. how old are they when this when this all takes place Josiah at the beginning of the war is twenty seven years old okay uh, interesting a little bit older but there were a lot of older you know men that went in uh, the other thing that was a little bit different he was six foot four which by oh, the time my. he was a giant <laughs> she was nineteen years old he he was from the town of Hanover but was in college at Monmouth Illinois she was in Peoria and. To me, it's fascinating to me to hear the two of you who have served our country talk about what letters meant, because it is exactly what you see in the letters from 1861 to 64. And I'll, there's one side of it missing, which I which I'll speculate about why I think that happened. Back in that time, and people tend to think, and we've gotten so much into texting where nobody cares whether you're spelling the right word. Some people just hope the autocorrect. Sometimes it fixes it. Sometimes it turns it into a right. real botched yeah. piece of communication. <laughs> but, you know, it's all LOL. It's emojis. Yeah. Whereas back at the time, people were extremely careful about what they wrote. And these, these are two people who were um, very educated people extremely educated uh, in her because she was from a fairly well-to-do family. He was had significant education, continued it after the war. So spoiler alert, he survives the war. Um, <laughs> Good. So, but they actually viewed worth through how well the letters were written. And, you know, please excuse this poor excuse for communication, et cetera. And they're well-written. They were fairly easy to understand. There were some you know, capitalizations and punctuations that were kind of odd, and they were pretty well written, except for when particularly her would turn it on the side and start writing over the top of what she'd already <laughs> written and drives you crazy trying to figure wow. that out. And the question I usually get is, well, well, how did you get them? And I had a call from a guy who I worked with when I was in the oil industry who said he inherited a cabin, on, uh, an unheated cabin on a lake in Wisconsin and found some stuff, and I helped him sell that. And he goes, I think I found Civil War letters. I said, well, send them to me. I'll take a look. We'll see what we got. And they were. And as I looked at it, I realized what I had and got some really, it, it, you know, to show you how people don't value it, I took them to a couple of dealers who said, well, you leave them with me, and I'll tell you if I want them. Like, they're not mine. I can't leave them with you. One guy said, um, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I don't want the woman's letters because it was back and forth communication. I don't want the woman's letters. And there were some post-war letters. I don't want those. I just want his. I'll give you $15 a letter, send him 10, the owner, and you keep five. How's that sound? I went, no, it doesn't sound good at all because right. then the yeah. story never gets told. And, and, the right. story, no, you, you never piece it together again. So I, so I kind of bit the bullet and bought all of them and found out exactly what it was between this captain in the 17th Illinois, who was an Irish immigrant, came here at a very young age, um, and back and forth for them for you know, three and a half years, roughly. Um, and people always, people value, there's a value that people place on letters from certain regiments, et cetera. Um, if it's the, you know, the Irish Brigade or an Iron Brigade unit sure, or yeah. Stonewall Brigade, um, you know, 17th was a pretty well fought they went through. Uh, the Battle of Fredericktown, Missouri. They went through Donaldson. They went through uh, uh, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Meridian. So they they went through some pretty horrific stuff. And there's some great battle stuff in there that was never previously published that I found. 
Um, but just to see them and what happened a lot of times is the soldiers' letters were kept because they'd go back home and people would, oh, this is from so-and-so, we're going to put it aside. And sure. a lot of times the letters from home weren't because you, you guys know this. How do you, when you're out in the field and you're carrying everything else, sometimes they get soiled, they get wet, sometimes you can't keep them. So mm-hmm. he did. If something is important to you, it doesn't matter how much you're carrying, if, if something is really important to you, you're going to find a way to carry it still. You might even you might even give up other things that will make your life much easier just to make space for those things that you really care about. Um, now, I know, they, and they didn't have the packs that we have nowadays that have all the extra room. And, right. Um, I know they had to carry a lot less on their person. But that being said, I, uh, I almost don't find it surprising that he was able to keep them because... Honestly, if like they're that important to them, you know, the there's something you find a way to carry. And even if you lose a few, and when you lose something like that, it is like it's it's a moment. Like you have like a little bit of a heartbreak moment. I, I yeah. I've had letters at, when I was in boot camp that would get, you know, notorious notoriously. <laughs> the drill instructors in Marine Corps boot camp like to toss your things just everywhere around the room, and sometimes it gets tossed and you never see it again. You know, whatever. Like I have. <laughs> This just to just to prove a point, I had retainers, these like Invisalign <laughs> retainers when I went to boot camp. First day we got our drill instructors. First day. I had been at boot camp for three days. The first day we get our drill instructors, they toss our stuff, didn't see my retainers the rest of the time I was there. <laughs> Things just disappeared. My mom was so Things upset when I got back. She's like, I spent so much money on those teeth. <laughs> oh yeah. And they had slid. But you know, um, so when you lose a letter, especially if it's one from like your girlfriend or the person you're courted, those are special. That's exactly what they smell like them, you know, Mm -hmm. like they, they, they do so many things on so many different levels for your psyche and your morale. And when you lose one, it's a bummer, but ideally you still have plenty, plenty more to, to, to keep. So the way you described mail call for the both of you Mm -hmm. is exactly what mail call was in 1861, two, three, and four, you know, they'd announce it. The guys would come streaming out of their tents or wherever they were. And the, guy who didn't get one would would not be happy he would not be pleased and you you can see in some letters as i'm sure you guys have seen there's this and i've got a few others that i've collected over the years is how come no one writes me why is no one sending me anything if you aren't going to write me i'm going to stop right i mean it you know it's it's this very very um strong reaction and a feel of abandonment almost when the letters don't come that's that's exactly right i mean what do you what's your take on that i feel like that's a hundred percent on point well yeah it is a hundred percent on point i had a similar experience in paris island and um for some reason or another i didn't receive mail for almost all the first phase (laughs) and i was and i was writing and sending them home and then i wasn't return nothing was coming my way and i wrote a final letter i said i'm not going to write anymore and i sent that and uh then some letters started coming my way. Okay. It was like in the darkness, I just had to accept the fact that, all right, I am alone here. I'm going to just do this. And then out of nowhere, a letter finally came for me. And when it was mail call and everybody else got one, I got one. And then I felt that first burst of excitement, which changed my view and on it. It normalizes things. Okay, great. Normalizes right, things, everything's yeah. good. I got yeah. that connection to yeah. home. And, That's and, the connection to home. And listen, that in the, the feeling you get, like you are so excited you're so excited for that touch from some, like from your previous life, you know, you're so excited about it and like, and, and feeling connected to the people you care about. You can't hardly wait to get that thing open and read it. And then you'll finish reading it and then you'll reread it again. Like that, you know I mean? You'll do it a few times just to make sure you didn't forget anything. And then you'll just kind of walk around smiling, holding the thing for a little bit. Cause you have a little piece of home. It's, it's a, it's a very interesting thing because we, at the same time, we didn't do, I mean, after boot camp, you really don't do letters that often. I wrote a few letters uh, from Afghanistan, our, sec- our second deployment. Yeah. And I, I wrote like one or two letters home. I don't think I received any letters on mm-hmm. that, you know, but we also had a way that we had, you know, the, the MWR is what they call it, but you go in and you can make phone calls and, and all that stuff when it's open. Let me ask, I'm curious, ask each of you, because this came through in the letters that I had, that the person writing a letter from home you know, in this case, Jenny would apologize. I don't have anything exciting to tell you. We went to church. It snowed. We went on the sleigh ride. But it seemed to me that, and I would seem and ask you guys whether this is the case, it doesn't matter. You're, you're hearing something from home. You want to know that the people at home are as best as they can experiencing a normal life, are continuing with life, thinking about you, but continuing with their life as well. And for, for him, and I assume for you guys, just to hear that they're doing well, they're able to have some stability and normality despite 
the, the the insanity of the times was important to these soldiers, and I assume to you guys as well. Oh, I, absolutely. I can remember that very much so because it seemed like we were out there doing so much, and we were writing about so much in our lives that was changing. When you get a letter from home, it seemed like exactly just that, apologetic or like, hey, this is kind of really the same old, same old's going on because what you don't realize when you get home after you've been gone for a little bit, for the most part, everything and everybody's still the same. Mm -hmm. There may be, at this day and age, there might be a new movie out or a new song on the radio. Justin Bieber didn't exist before (laughs) I went to Iraq and I came back and he was all over the place. (laughs) Oh, something, you'll notice something like that. But for the most part, everybody and everything is the same. You just want to know what's going on and, and see that everything is okay there. Well, I, I would put it I would put it this way, uh, it, like this is kind of how it registers in my mind. Because you're right, you don't really care what they write. I mean, to a certain degree, they could just they could be writing in the stats from the last sports, you know, baseball game or something, and it would st- just because it's from them, it would still right. feel special. Right. But really, what you're what the meat and potatoes of what you're looking for is is you want to see if they miss you too, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 to prove that they've sent you a letter. So like, they, not that it needs to be verbalized. But you want to, see, like, especially if this is your, you know, your wife or your girlfriend or, like, that aspect of your life, you want to hear what, like, you want to hear what's making them laugh if they had, if they laughed throughout mm-hmm. one of their days. You want to hear about the friends they have and it, in certain ways about the intimate areas of their life, and you get that from what they do throughout their day. Well, this, you know, I saw this thing the other day and it made me laugh and, you know, I, I, I went over to this person's house and we had dinner we talked about you. They hope you're doing well. They said they're going to send you a package, like... Little things like that makes such a huge difference. Um, But at the end of the day, getting the letter is the most important part. And and like I said, it could be stats from the last baseball game. And and really, at the end of the day, you would still be just as happy with that letter. Something else to add to that. Sorry about cutting you off there, but a lot of future planning. I feel like uh, you oh, yeah, write, we're going to do this when we get when you get back, and we'll do this when you yeah, get right. back. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And the and the planning for yeah. when I get back home. So yeah, the letters that on which I wrote the book. It's interesting. Uh, all of her letters, with a few exceptions, and you guys are right. There's a couple you sent. She's he references a letter from pick out you know April twentieth, and it, I don't have it. Okay, that got lost. Something happened, um, but they stop. He 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 goes back home, gets ill returns to Vicksburg December on Christmas Day, 1863. Great timing. And, um, of course, they're in occupied Vicksburg at that point. There are no more letters from her at that point, all the way through until his the end of his service in June of 64, which uh, he opted not to reenlist, obviously. Uh, and I, I don't know why that happened. It's clear that she wrote because he says, I got your letter from the other day. And my suspicion is, and uh, you have to think about that, you know, service members probably think about this as well. I think that because they went out on the Meridian campaign in February of 64 and some of his men were captured out there, my suspicion is that he had taken probably a lot of the letters home with him when he went home in December of 63. To keep him safe, left them there. To keep him safe, left them there. And that, I, I think, because he saw some of his men captured when they went out into the backwoods of Mississippi, I think he started to get word. What if I'm captured? I don't want someone reading these letters. So I think he destroyed the letters from 1864, which is kind of sad because it is sad, yeah. his are incredibly poetic, even though for the most part their fighting had ended after Meridian. Uh, the, his his descriptions of being in camp, seeing the smoke from the campfires wafting up, seeing, seeing as he calls it, lovely Luna, the moon overhead. They're very, very poetic because he's, as I said, well-educated writes very well but he i think obviously destroyed the letters you know that makes sense though because you have to do that kind of stuff nowadays too yeah. especially if you're at risk of being captured you know mm-hmm. opsec th- yeah operational security for exactly the, the non-military listener out there but so i i have a question what uh do you have like a, do you have an example letter of his that that we could hear from or um, or do you have like a, a certain section of the letter that you remember that he talks about and, and kind of uh, what they sound like? Yeah, there's 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 so many of them and they're kind of different types. Some of them are the courting letters in which, and from her, honestly, some of them are the ones, well, when are you getting home? So-and-so's home. How come you're not home? And yeah. You, you, know, you, you, you kind of get these type things, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. But some of the letters from him are relatively short. Interestingly, he, and this is something my research has shown, the men tend, and I'd be interested in your perspective, the men tend not to go into details about what they saw at a Shiloh. It's just horrific. They don't mm-hmm. want to put 
send that to the folks back home. They don't want them to see it. They'll be maybe more open with other people. A um, couple of the letters are ones that he had to report on the death of one of his men. He, as a captain, he was commander of Company F, and uh, there was no no system for notifying the people back home. It fell to either a friend or the company commander or perhaps the, the regimental commander, typically a colonel, to send back. And some of these letters, in fact, some of them are, one of the letters he wrote that found its way into the newspaper uh, in 1862 from the Battle of Donelson was he sent it back to the family, uh, a man from his unit, and kind of graphically described a, a shell carried away the top of your son's head. I don't think that's the kind of thing that people back home want to know. Mm -mm, then he no. went into very long detail about where they buried the body, how they took care of it, how how you can find it, et cetera. So, the, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these are just kind of passing the time. I'm going to do a letter, but some of them really make you reflect on how this is changing the individual, as it's called. I get into a lot of it in the book, the hardening process that, that these guys go through. Yeah. And then as the letters change later on, as you see this rise of the Copperhead movement and the rise of what are, you know, kind of the Peace Democrats about these guys are indignant that they're not getting the support back home that they believe they should. And in fact, that they have earned the right to say more than the people back home should about what they're going through. That is 100 percent still the case today. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I can remember, I, my opinions on this have changed now that I'm older and have been out of the Marine Corps for a while, but I can remember, especially when you're a jun like a super junior guy, like first deployment, do you remember coming back and, and, and thinking like, well, you know, what do you, you can't, you have nothing to say about it. You don't, you don't do anything with it. You're not, you're not the one going over. You're not the one fighting. You're not mm -hmm. the one doing any of that stuff. I, um. I very much can see that it's it is 100 percent the case at least in my experience and with with a lot of the guys i know well your whole thought process just changes on everything immediately you do and the hardening mm -hmm. aspect i'm it's interesting that you call it that because that is 100 percent still a thing if you so tommy and i uh our second our second deployment was to marja in afghanistan mm -hmm. and it was part of a, a very big offensive in helmand province marja was the last taliban stronghold at the time and it's and it was some of the most kinetic, you know, kinetic fighting of either war, um, mm. Iraq or Afghanistan. And the thing about it is it was an everyday kind of thing. You'd have a lot of places like Ramadi or Fallujah where, you know, the one battle might be super intense in, in, in comparison to what we would be getting on a daily basis. But that being said, you have a few days of that and it kind of subsides and you have a few days where nothing happens and it'll pick back up. And this is not to take away from guys that fought in Fallujah or Ramadi just comparing the way that they flow. I remember very few days, pretty much from after two weeks of being there until about two weeks out before we left, I remember very few days where I didn't get in a gunfight. And we were there for six months. Wow. And because of our job, too, I was a, I, we were both in charge of a crew serve weapon. It was a rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, section leaders for that. We got tasked out to the, the regular rifleman platoons. So I was a squad leader in my in my platoon, but because of our job and what we did for at least the first half of the deployment, they didn't, you know, Gunny Mack and Lieutenant V didn't have a standing post. They wanted to be able to have the rockets out on patrol, so we were doing two patrols a day. So a lot of the days it'd be like two two gunfights in a day. Sometimes, Sometimes. there'd be gunfights that would just last an entire day. Wow. It, it's just depended. But I can tell you that it's not only in myself, but noticeable in others that were on the deployment. Like the, the more and more you get in a deployment, I, I used to tell people, you probably wouldn't have liked me that much. You know, after I had been there for a few months, I was mean, you know, except for the except to the guys that I was with. But even even your interaction with them is a little harder. And it's usually generally a little harder anyways. It's the Marine Corps. So it's yeah. <laughs> it's usually a little a little a little more extreme. But you uh, I'm trying to th think of be the best way to articulate this. You do harden. It's a kind of a defense mechanism. You do. Like, you don't feel the same sympathy that you do when you right. first get there. You definitely don't feel any hesitation whatsoever when you like when when having to, to really do your job and, and close with and destroy the enemy. You are hardened to the, the, the outside things that you see as well too, like the collateral damage to mm -hmm. warfare as well. Not saying that you just go, I'm not saying that it's, you're, you're hardened against like civilian deaths and stuff, right. but, but seeing that and seeing it, you know, dead animals and all that kind of stuff, beginning to end comparison is just night and day different and and it goes beyond that too i've talked to you about this before i'm pretty sure but like my senses i feel like after i had been in about a, a week maybe two weeks worth of gunfights i feel like all my senses 
elevated to a point that mm-hmm. I, I, I almost feel like, I almost feel like it's hard to, to relay it to someone because they're going to feel like I'm lying. When I first went on my first patrol in Afghanistan, they only took out the squad leaders with, with the unit we were replacing. And you just slowly integrate your, the, the new unit, my unit coming in to take over that AO, you slowly integrate your guys in, into that force until it's like a left seat, right seat until the unit that's there is fully, you know, pulled out of patrols and they can leave. I think you kind of got the reins now. And to start that, they take squad leaders and, and platoon, you know, platoon sergeant and platoon commander out for a few patrols. <clears throat> and the first one we're doing, we're walking around and all these guys, these young guys from this unit that we're relieving are like, oh, we got a guy on this roof over here about to click out. We got, he's doing this. He's laying down, but he has something on his shoulder. And I'm, I'm scanning as hard as I can. I've got a scope on my rifle. I'm looking through my scope. I don't see what they're talking about. And this happens like 20, 30 times all day throughout long. this patrol. And by the end of it, I turn around, I look at my platoon sergeant, and I'm like, Gunny, uh, I didn't see anything they were talking about. I'm a little worried. I'm concerned. I, I don't know if I've, I don't know what I've, what, how I'm missing it, but I'm not seeing any of this stuff. I won't be able to see it when we're out on patrol with the, just our guys. And he giggled. Now, this, he's been in combat numerous times as an infantry gunnery sergeant. He's, he's been in all kind of combat. And um, he's giggling, and he, and he looks at me, and he goes, "Just give it a few weeks." Mm-hmm. And and at the time, I'm thinking, I don't I don't really see how that's gonna make a difference. But sure enough, man, I'm telling you, your your eyes become hawk like that. Your sense of smell is is unbelievably ridiculous. Your hearing is everything is elevated, and I think it's all in some way related to the hardening process as well. It's like you almost become more primal in in a sense, like you resort back yeah. to a primal state. Or more so in, in a primal state than a civilized state, if that makes sense. I would think some of it is learning more, but I, I would think I, I got to believe some of it's a physiological response to that as well. It's got to be both of them. It definitely is, and I I know that because I could smell things. I mean, I have a pretty good sense of smell, but I could smell things ridiculously well. Mm-hmm. I, I like there could be. I don't. I have. I have an example, but it's a pretty nasty story, and I don't want to tell that one. I, all right. One thing they grow over there is is marijuana plants, mm-hmm. and usually they're in big fields. They do have a harvest season though, and they'll cut all that down and they'll turn that into hashish, and and that's what they. That's part of their crop. They make profit on the the farmers over there. So by this point, all of the marijuana plants have been cut down, and we're out on a patrol one day. And all of a sudden, I smell marijuana. And it's not like they smoke marijuana like they do here in the States where you might smell it just walking down the road. Mm-hmm. That's They make it into these little hashish bars. Mm-hmm. And then they, I actually don't, I don't know if I've ever seen an Afghani actually smoke hashish. I know they have it over there. I have seen them before, but I don't know if, uh, they they liked the, uh, what's that stuff? They the would dip. Put, it's uh, like dip. Naswa. 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 Okay. The, it, it's like green dip. It, and I think it has <laughs> opium in it. It's crazy. It's wild okay. west over there. And uh, anyways, that being said, no one's outside smoking this. It's not like you. I smell a plant, but all the plants have been gone now for about a month. And we're walking around, and not that I'm really looking for it hard, but I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. I'm like, is there, a, is there a weed field still up? Like, are we going to have to come out here and, you know, take this down or get rid of the crops somehow? Because... Around that time, they were talking about burning the opium fields and all that stuff. And um, about a click and a half away from where I was at, by the time our patrol gets over to this other compound, because it's compound, farm field, compound, farm field, very very spread out. Don't forget the canals. And, and a ton of, it's, it's super irrigated, so really big canals everywhere. And by the time we get to the next compound, we've covered about a, a click and a half, uh, a kilometer and a half worth of, of distance. And the smell is just getting stronger and stronger the whole time. I go inside this compound and there's one lone marijuana plant in the middle of this, you know, in this yard inside of this compound. And I had started smelling it over a kilometer away. My nose does not work like that now. And it didn't work like that before then. But while we were there, like that's to give you an idea, it's extreme levels of like heightened senses. It was- Being a U.S. Marine and fighting for my country is one of the things in my life I am most proud of. Although there are so many positives that came from my experience in the Marine Corps, like many of you, I had another battle I had to fight when my service was done. It's no secret that PTSD affects many active duty and former servicemen and women every day, as well as their family members and the first responder community. If you or a family member is struggling with PTSD, 
Colby and I recommend looking into the Mighty Oaks Foundation for help in your battle with this condition. The Mighty Oaks Foundation is a faith-based veteran service organization that teaches combat veterans struggling with post-traumatic stress how to get beyond combat trauma and live their lives in the manner God intended. Many combat vets are unable to reintegrate back into civilian life, leaving their families to deal with the aftermath of broken homes and suicide at times. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these warriors are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. Their mission is to serve and restore our nation's warriors and families who have endured hardship through their service to America and to help them find a new life purpose through hope in Christ and their resiliency and peer-to-peer recovery programs. More than 4,000 alumni have participated in Mighty Oaks programs as they maintain one of the highest success rates of any recovery program in preventing veteran suicide and divorce. In fact, the programs are so successful that they receive hundreds of active duty military on official orders each year. Additionally, through a proactive effort, Mighty Oaks has provided resiliency programs to over 150,000 active duty troops on military bases worldwide. Find more information on the Mighty Oaks Foundation by visiting americafogofwar.com and follow the link Mighty Oaks Foundation located in the menu at the top of the home page. Never fight alone. Get some backup in your fight with PTSD today. I wish there could be a study done on it, but I feel like the only way to do a study on that is to put people in combat. Yeah, which we don't want to do. Right. But, but right. I got to believe that that's that it is. And then when your body no longer needs to function in that manner, the body kind of recedes. It's you know like the the fight or flight mechanism. I think that that the body does. And the logical extension and interesting a couple things that and as we've talked about, I've been studying the Civil War for a long, long time. That there are things that, as I've said to people, that. In the course of the book and, and and the study and research for the book, things that surprised me, they either rebutted things I thought about the war or they added something new that I'd never thought about. And one of them, continuation of the hardening process, and for me, because I'm a fair amount older than you guys that I remember, is the war in Vietnam and the end and the end of that. I was just slightly too, too young for that. But I remember how these guys were treated when they came home. It was appalling. And I was right. stunned when I read this and did research about the guys who came home, they were treated in almost the same manner at the end of the Civil War. We tend to think, oh, it was great, 1865, we had these huge parades and everybody loved them and the GAR started and everything else. Well, it turns out that a lot of these veterans had a heck of a hard time getting the job because they looked at them and said, oh no, you've killed people, you've stolen things, you've burned houses down, you've done this, I'm not hiring you which led to obviously issues for these guys because what we now identify as PTSD and the need for a lot of folks that have served to get that help, they it just turned a blind eye to that. So suicides, alcoholism, mm-hmm. spousal abuse was rampant. Even Joshua Chamberlain was accused of spousal abuse, which, which had been hushed up for years. So the analogies and the, and the connections to Vietnam as well as and, and the tie to Civil War soldiers, the GAR, which we all thought of as this great, they were, the, there were churches that banned the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was their VFW, from meeting there because they called them an extra legal organization that didn't trust them because these are guys that killed people again. Um, the other thing that caused me to think, and I'd said this guy, he didn't re up. You know, of course, they went in for three years, most of the units, and in 64, they're like, we're going to lose our best guys, the guys that have gone through Gettysburg and Antietam and Vicksburg and Shiloh. So what do we do? And they tried to induce them to stay. And I thought about this, the guys who said, nope, I'm done. I did my three years. I'm going home. When they got home, it was kind of the war's still on. Grant's Overland campaign is killing thousands and thousands of men. And all these guys probably got was a little slap on the pay, you know, yeah, okay, welcome back. And then I wondered how they thought the next year, when all these guys who might have served for six months had this great big parade and everything, and trying to compare and contrast how we treat our returning veterans and people that have done so much for this country, it's something that, that, that we've got to grapple with now. But interestingly, we haven't figured it out from 170 years ago yet. Yeah. I, well, listen, and it's funny you say that because we got out and the, the war was still going on, yeah. and not for a whole lot longer, but it, it was still very active. And... Uh, I remember having moments, not immediately, so not within the first year of getting out, but I remember maybe at year two, two and a half, having these moments where I thought I would think about, man, I should go back. 
the war is still on. I should keep fighting. That was mm. my feeling as well. As bad as it can be or as great as it can be, it's you have that feeling constantly about, should I go back? What do I You what feel I almost do? compelled to do it. Yeah, you feel compelled as if like... Uh, it's unfinished lost business it. for the two of you. Well, and you've, you've lost friends in the process. Yeah, like a lot right. of people have sacrificed just to get to where you are. You mm-hmm. feel like you should finish it out almost. And but, you're still hearing about these guys that are still overseas. Right. But at the same time, when, when our four years came up, wasn't a chance you were convincing me to stay in, <laughs> uh, 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 right, you know, to re-enlist. I, I needed that like one year little break, I yeah. think, before my mind was able to... Because I, I think it was still in that very much hardened phase. Because you come back and it's almost like you don't really care about anything. Did you feel the same way? It depends like about what. Well, like like there there's just kind of an aura about you that you don't care about much. Like, all right, cool, whatever. I don't I don't want to do that, so I'm gonna go over here. Just stick you know, to like, yourself, kind yeah, of. Yeah, very stick to yourself. Like, don't want they don't want to be involved with much. But I'm curious, do you see that in his letters at all? He had, and it's interesting. I, you know, you could argue that. Maybe you didn't see it because he was he was a very religious person, as was she. He became a Presbyterian minister after the war. He went back, finished his undergrad degree, and stayed. He came home, got married, and was like, bye, I'm going to finish college. You wonder how that went over. <laughs> um, so, But he was very grounded in his faith, and he did. There are times when you can see a bit of it coming through where he doesn't see a positive end to this when he's seen so much death at, at Shiloh and Donaldson and Vicksburg, and you can see it kind of waning and flagging, and then he might get a letter from her which will pick him up a bit, or he'll see something else and he'll see the end of it. But he um, kind of jokes with her about going back in after four years. Her father was a state senator from Peoria, so I, I get the impression in the letters, it's not bluntly stated, but I get the impression that he, her, her dad was trying to get him a commission in one of the new uh, black units. Um, gotcha. He turned it down. And interesting, there was another interesting quote from another soldier, not in his unit, but who was trying, they were trying to recruit him to stay. And he said, lager beer has lost all its power over oh, me, man. which was kind of funny. <laughs> um, but I think his faith helped him. And you can't say he didn't see, he didn't see conflict. He did. You can't say he didn't see death. He did. Um, but I'm sure that he got through and, all indications are that he had a he had he had a good life. He had physical maladies that he picked up, particularly from the outside. I believe it sounds like malaria. Not a hundred percent sure, but it sounds like he got malaria from his time in Mississippi. But um, and interestingly, at the beginning of the war, before the war, he was at he was at school here in Western PA at Westminster Prep, which is now Westminster College, and he took uh, a writing for the student newspaper very abolitionist stance defending John Brown. And then interestingly, not a single thing comes through in his letters. Uh, maybe because Jenny's dad was became a Democrat and <laughs> hated Lincoln. And so yeah. he's like, well, if I, I don't want to tick off and stop this developing relationship right, right. here. But Better watch what I say. <laughs> now you, you, you pretty <laughs> much smart. see. And after the war, he seems pretty well adjusted. What do you think? Do you think that's because he had a purpose? He was going back to school in his faith. Faith is Faith is a profound purpose for people that are committed to it. That it is. And what I would say about that is the significance and the insignificance, because we need both of those in our lives, a Mm -hmm. little bit of both. But when you're there, of course, your significance, there's not a question about it because you know your purpose and what you're doing while you're in the action. You're you're a very Mm -hmm. integral part of everything that's happening there. Right. So when you get out, you may lose that feeling of significance and, and have feelings of insignificance, but then can you get yourself back mm-hmm. in line or back towards something like uh, finishing school, like you said he did, or or his faith and, and something that keep him grounded in that sense. But like anything, even though he has all those, or had all those and, and those directions that he was going towards, I know for sure he still felt insignificant in some some way or another. Uh, I'm sure that's probably true, and I wonder whether or not the fact that he was an officer and responsible for, at the beginning of the war, roughly 100 men, and then, of course, that number dwindles, uh, whether that's different, uh, and, and he kind of has to keep himself strong for that because, of course, he's got to oversee the the welfare of his, whatever the number is, at any point in time, 70, 80 men. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like a big problem with guys from our era because uh, that's all really, I mean, with 100% accuracy, that's the only thing I can kind of speak on, having mm-hmm. seen it all first person and dealing with it like myself. I think for guys that have, you know, been in very real, very serious combat, they get out, you know, they, they leave the service, they get out, they go back home. 
if you don't have purpose, because that's what you're missing, that that significance you're talking about, that's how I would phrase it personally, just in, in my mind, that's how I think of it as like a purpose. You, you have a very clear purpose in the military, um, especially during wartime. And your purpose is very, very de- clearly defined, and everybody's on board. It's a bigger purpose than yourself. It's something bigger than yourself mm-hmm. you belong to, and it's something very important. And there's a, there's a lot riding on it. So when you when you leave that and you come back to a a normal little town life mm-hmm. that you've just been away from for however long, you know, for us four years, for him three years. So mm-hmm. uh, when that's a long time to be away from home. When you come back. If you don't have a clear plan, like he did, where you know I'm going to go back home, I'm going to go to the seminary, I'm going to finish, I'm going to I'm going to become a pastor. That's what I want to do. You can really start to get into a, a negative place and flounder. And I think honestly, I think the onset of PTSD is it's not 100% brought on by that, but I feel like it's 90% of the cause of where mm. you start to see symptoms of PTSD uh, because you also have guys that have been in. You know, very intense gunfights and have lost many friends and who are going to be different in a way. They are going to have some some symptoms, but they're definitely not affected on the same scale as somebody that is in the same position and they don't have a purpose. You know, guys that come out and have very clear goals on what they want to do. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to go be a politician or I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to, I'm going to make my, you know, make myself have right a purpose in something larger than, than just me. And that can take, that can, took me a long time to find what that was for me. And in the time that it does take to find that, it can be, it can feel like you're just drowning in those symptoms. It can be very difficult. Um, so that, honestly, that, the example that you have of, of Josiah getting out and going home, that lines right up with what I had been thinking initially on the whole prospect of, of, PTSD and its yeah. relation to guys coming back from war. He had a very clear purpose, and and faith, especially in this era, faith is probably the biggest purpose you commit your life to to mm-hmm. these people. Um, so it, you know, especially a very a, a very deep believer. So I, I think that that was that paid to his benefit, and I'm sure he had problems. But I think the reason you don't see too many of those problems in his letters and what he's left behind is because of because that of the purpose. I I I'd really do it. I as, as important as as important as Jenny is to him and all that stuff, right. I think it's much more beyond that. I think it has much more to do with what is he contributing his time, the the time on earth that he's just so fought, yes. so hard to preserve his, because that's what you're preserving in combat, is your time and your friend's time on earth because someone's trying to take that time. So what am I going to do with that time when I get back? Yeah. You yeah. know, And that's a very that's a very hard thing to figure out. And it's it's honestly, it's everybody that has it figured out from the time they get out, I'm always very impressed by because that's that's a kind of a rare thing. That's why you have so many reports of guys from the Civil War becoming alcoholics or suicide right. or or uh, spousal abuse. All of that stuff, I think, stems from the lack of purpose. Which makes even more tragic what we had talked about earlier, which is these guys who thought they had a purpose. Perhaps I'm going back. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to work in this store. I'm going to continue that. And we're told. I don't want hired. you anymore yeah. because I, I think you've changed. I can't trust you. I know you've killed people. I've heard reports. I've heard this, which you know, it's a great point you make. Could be enough to start people on that slide with everything they've seen from 61 to 64 or 5 on top of the fact that they're now rejected when they return home. Incredibly tragic. It is. It's it's a shame. And you see that a little bit even nowadays, but not in the same way. You'll have guys that have been in charge of well, like Josiah, they'll be in charge of numerous men, mm-hmm. up to you know a hundred guys, and they'll get out and they'll go apply for a management position somewhere, but they're not qualified because there's no there's nothing documenting saying that they've gotten a degree that they know how to do this. Right. So they have to kind of restart from square one. That's about as bad as you'll see it nowadays. But to have the qualifications and to show up or at a place that you were already working before the war started, and then be like, no. Sorry, we uh, we heard yeah. this about you. That's the one benefit about your world being overseas in a different place. Is usually no one back home is going to hear anything that happens over there. You know, and I, not that I'm ashamed of anything I've done, but I definitely wouldn't want all of my war stories shared with my family. Sure. Would you? Sure. R- no, because that going off of that, that's something that right now I think is coming a lot more into light. I would say in recent years is the um, the moral aspect of it is that with PTSD, it, you also question. Your morals, like what I had done, where I, where I was, and what I did, was it morally right? And you try to think, yeah, it was right, but 
I spent my whole life growing up knowing that I shouldn't do these things. But you go over there and say, for example, you're in the combat and you're fighting and yeah. you take someone's life and, and now you've done something that you believe is morally wrong, but you're in a place where you had to do it because it was wartime. So everything morally relates. So then when you talk about the veterans coming home during the Civil War and they're being turned away from jobs, turned away from careers, even though they have the credentials and they have the ability um, to complete any task in front of them, and someone says that to you, like, hey, you're not cut out for this. You've probably right. killed people. You've probably done really bad things. Like, Then all of a sudden, you, as a veteran, you think, my, you think maybe you question your morals again. Maybe, did I do something wrong, actually, or did I yeah. not? It, it, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's a question. It's something that's always um, circling around in your head, I guess. i got to imagine that's a conundrum for every fighting man that, 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 and woman now who, who has been out there. Uh, and it leads to the other interesting question about why, you know, why men and now women – you know, do this. And we talked before about, geez, people back home know or don't know this. And at least interesting discussions as well, which I talk about in the book about why why men went forward in the Civil War. We know why they joined. Interestingly, they didn't join because in most cases in the North because they're abolitionists. They right. joined because I'm going to save the Union or it's a great, everyone else is going or it sounds like a great thing to do or they're going to pay me 13 bucks a month or whatever. Um, but what is abundantly clear, and you guys, I'm, I would imagine, would probably second this. Once you're there and you're you're going forward under fire, and you know Josiah's letters make this abundantly clear too. It's not because let's go save the Union. Mm-hmm. I'm going forward because of the guy next to me. Yeah, you don't want to leave them me. hanging. You, they're you're, they're counting on you. Absolutely, and particularly in the Civil War. Think about it. I mean, you guys came from disparate areas, but Civil War company was formed from Gettysburg. So right. if you performed poorly, you did things you weren't supposed to. You ran and you were a coward, people back home would absolutely know because it could be that you're literally your brother is in the rank next to you. Your your cousin might be the sergeant. Your father might be the captain. And so um, th- those are things that force you and move you forward. I could only imagine because they don't, you know, they don't let you, they don't let family serve in the same right. platoon at least. And, and when we were in, we had two brothers that were in the company with us, but they were yep. in different platoons. Okay. And, um, and they do that for a reason. Uh, I think a lot of that you can find examples of England doing that in World War One, the having the 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 neighborhood uh, brigades. Yes, and then and then you have a battle like the Somme, and now an entire you know now an entire town has just lost all of their even World War Two, the Bedford Boys. Right. right. So you you end up with terrible terrible experiences doing yes. that. So so obviously that's for a reason. But outside of that, because you already feel such a responsibility to the guys that you're with. Nowadays, not being your family when you show up and being from different parts of the country, you do, you know, you do become a family in a sense, but you feel very responsible towards them as they do towards you. Yes. Uh, I can't imagine what that feeling feels like, though, if it's a family member that you've had, you know, in your house your entire life, and now you're also in the same position together where the bond would have to be even that much more yes. strong. Um, and what it would be like to watch one of them let you down and, and, and run away from the fight or to watch one of them or get killed wounded. killed horribly. Yeah, or killed. And, and that would be, it would be a nightmare. So I'm kind of curious. You mentioned one of his first battles is Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. One of his first. The very first one they went through, which is kind of an interesting point, is Battle Fredericktown, Missouri, where they were chasing a Confederate guerrilla named Jeff Thompson. The reason I bring that up is this. As I was doing research, part of the material that came with the letters I have, I have a lot of CDVs, people, guys in his regiment, guys in his company, uh, even one of Grant, which I think I know how he wound up with. But as I have the original muster in sheet for Company F, 17th Illinois, which is almost as large as the table that we're sitting at. That's so cool, though. That is so cool. And as I look down the list of names, and the guy who swore them in to serve federal service was a guy named Captain John Pope, who would become General John Pope no of way. Second Manassas. Yeah. But I'm looking down, I see this name, it says James Earp. And I went, I wonder if, turns out Wyatt Earp's brother was in his company. That's cool. Wyatt Earp was born in Monmouth, Illinois. The house where he's born is still there. Uh, Virgil, to go into the Tombstone movie a little bit, yeah. which everybody knows. Virgil right. was in the 83rd Illinois. They had a half-brother, Newton, in an Iowa cavalry unit. Wyatt and Morgan were too young to serve, but James was in the 17th Illinois. He was wounded at the Battle of Fredericktown, shot through the shoulder, and discharged because he couldn't raise his arm up. So there's, you know, when you see the 
okay corral gunfight no reason to take james who was with him in town he can't raise his arm nothing he can right. do for you <laughs> so he was gone by then so yeah the first one was uh henry and donaldson henry was fairly easy they were they just did a lot of scavenging and picked up souvenirs well, the, and navy, the, the, navy the navy took care of that. takes right. care of things we right. we do uh we do these one of our episode types are we call them hip pocket history episodes okay. so they're they're bonus episodes but we go into greater detail on things we cover in our our main episodes yeah. and we just did one on uh forts henry and donaldson and it was a lot of fun doing research for him and talking about it, it. Is. but as a marine i get so excited getting to see these you know these joint navy army yes. operations especially the brown water navy i think like, absolutely that's, it's very very cool absolutely and super high speed considering you know what they had to work with at the time they're doing very complicated stuff when they don't even have radios i i find it fascinating but as we learned and to let the listeners know after henry they make the march towards donaldson and things change it's not so much a navy battle it's anymore. not an easy one either it's it's a rough battle in the book i found um, a guy who was a captain of one of the other companies in josiah's regiment left behind, which I discovered just doing my research, incredible account of what his company did. And that previously unpublished name was Frank Peets, who went on to command the unit during parts of the Vicksburg campaign. Um, it, it was it was a rough battle, and it opened up their eyes. I well, think. I could imagine. First off, you have the temperature mm -hmm. when they're there. It's freezing cold. cold Absolutely. Night. And on the march, a lot of guys, from what I had read, had been throwing off their blankets exactly and, right. and coats because they were trying to march through this crazy terrain. I, I'm, I'm assuming – I've never been there personally, so I'm assuming it's very thick, crowded, dense woods, kind of swampy probably too. And they get there that night, and then they can't have campfires and all that stuff. Exactly. And it's freezing cold. It's miserable being cold. But if it's cold at home, you can always get out of the cold. Yes. You know, you can walk inside. Even if you work outside all day, at the end of the day, chances are you're going to go inside your house where right. it's a little warmer. You can get under the blanket where it's a lot warmer. Take a hot shower. Mm -hmm. You'll be good. When you're out in the field like that, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean you get to go in somewhere warm. It just means it's dark now. <laughs> But you have to, right. you're still in it. And when you're in cold for that long, it sinks down so deep that even if you do get a little bit warmer air come your way, it still feels like your fingers are, are gone and your toes are gone. And then to have to wake up the next morning and start fighting uh, a very spirited Confederate counterattack, I'm sure it was a. Uh, I'm sure it was a pretty crazy fight, a pretty desperate fight, too. It was. It was bad. A lot of guys were killed. That, that you know, I had the example earlier about the, the, the guy Josiah had to write home about to inform his family how he had been killed. Very horrible. You know, they did win that. Um, but then not much long after that, in terms, you know, April was that, you know, they were at Shiloh, which they were in one of the front lines at Shiloh. The first, as you I'm sure you know, the first lines were really green troops. Right. Not that any of them had much experience. But uh, Sherman's men and, I guess, Prentice's men were just swallowed up. And all of a sudden, they hit Josiah's brigade. And it was not 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 a good day that first day of Shiloh. Mm -mm. For example, two days in combat at uh, Henry or Donaldson, whether it be one or the other. But it's, it's a lot, but it's still not a lot. So when you end up in another location in Shiloh, you may think, okay, I got this. I can see it. But you're in another location, another place, doing something different. After two days of combat, you haven't mastered fire and maneuver. You haven't mastered really anything except for knowing briefly what it was like. Yes. I mean, you, you probably still haven't actually mastered where to aim because there's a big thing a lot of new guys do in combat. They'll shoot too high. It seems to always be the case. Even the Taliban would shoot too high. You could tell they were new because you'd, you'd look up and a, and a tree branches would be falling off the tree. And you will read account after account after account of that from World War II, World War I, Civil War. Everybody right. talks about it. It's just like a telltale sign. It takes a little while to figure out where your rounds are impacting because it's not like you have someone over there going, "Oh, you're a little high. Right. Bring it down." <laughs> you know, you got you got to really figure out what's happening. So, you know, even even by that point, him and all the other guys and with him might be still figuring that out. Now, I will say the one thing they probably do have going for them though is there's no hesitation by that point. You know, if it's time to fight, it's time to fight. Um, and that's something that a green troop might have a little bit of a difficulty with. I can remember thinking the first time I pulled uh, the first time I shot my grenade launcher, I had a grenade, a 203 grenade launcher on my M4 in Afghanistan. And the first time I shot one, 
I was waiting for someone to come out and, and yell at me and t- tell me I was in trouble. I was going to go to jail, you know. But uh, that's the thing you have to get around because you're doing something that you could not get away with in any other time in your life up to that point, you know. But it's expected of you now, and it's just hard to trick your brain into getting past that little speed bump. And there was another thing that happened at Shiloh, and I'd be curious to see what you guys think about this and whether your experiences are the same. And it was, wasn't was Josiah, but as I was researching the battle, and of course, Civil War battles because of the black powder quickly after a round or two, all of a sudden it's just encased in smoke. In smoke. And um, Ambrose Bierce, who's a famous American writer, was at the Battle of Shiloh as a soldier. And he said, we knew nothing other what was going on other than the three feet around us. He said, who's behind us? Who's on our right? Who's on our left? Who's in front of us? They had no idea. And it was a great way of describing this complete uncertainty. So if you're green troops and you fire off, who are these guys coming out? And even for Ambrose Bierce, who had a little bit of experience, he was like, we have no idea what's going on here. None. I can uh, add to that because you're talking, Colby, about like uh, seeing the enemy and what you can observe, say, before the fight. But during the fight, yeah, I wouldn't say it was like too smoky all the time, like where you just can't see that much. But... A lot of times, because of the distance, you may not always see. Now, somebody may see somebody or something move, but a lot of times it's what you're listening for and what you're not really looking for, but what you know. And and when it comes with that experience is you you really know how to keep your front towards the enemy. So your front, you just face that way that it's coming. And you can hear it if it's coming to from your from your front or from your left or your right. You can hear you know kind of where it's coming from. So something like that, yeah, you may not be able to exactly see where you're shooting or where you're going or what you're doing or who's to our right or left. You just know which way, what your sector is, right. and you have to maintain your sector of fire and, and observe that and perform there. I've, I've only been on a smoky, uh, like in Marja, we only had one time where the, the battlefield was smoky enough to where it was like really hindering vision and being able to locate people and see where people are you know you have tracer rounds and sometimes they'll catch things on fire so they had just harvested uh all the poppy fields and they have these dried out you know poppy plants all stacked up one of them had caught fire and then it just spread it just went everywhere and huge fire and smoke i mean it was so thick and it got bad enough and was getting blown around it didn't seem like the wind was blowing one direction that day it seemed like it was like almost swirling it around and you get nervous because as a veteran guy, now I had been there for a minute by this point, I'm thinking, all right, I have a general idea of where the enemy is, and I have a general idea of where my sister unit is, the unit that we're working in tandem with, but I don't know exactly where they are. You know what I mean? And you got to be accountable for where your rounds go, otherwise you might end up with a, a blue-on-blue situation, like killing one of, your, one of the friendlies. And it makes you... It just adds a very a very different level of paranoia to the whole mix. Like, I hope I'm sure not does. getting ready to shoot one of my guys. Um, as a green troop, I can only imagine what that causes, because you don't even know to think of that really at that point, I, I'm sure, because these guys also are not going through boot camp like he and I did. They're not getting taught, you know, they're not getting taught the basics of being a, a, a rifleman and, and not much. All this, all They're this. They're getting a month, six weeks of training. Right, and a it. lot of it's marching, really, and le- yes. l- memorizing the the bugle calls and what the flags right. are and all that stuff. Outside of that, you know, like there's a there's a thing they teach us that if you're aiming down your rifle, if someone gets within this distance off the side of either side of your rifle, you don't shoot that direction, right? Like that's that's something you learn. You you learn not to stand within an arm's length of a, a wall because bullets ride walls. Right. And, and so if you're closer than that, you could just catch a ricochet from anywhere just because it's decided to bounce down this wall. You learn a ton of stuff like that. You learn how to pie around corners instead of being right up on the edge of it. You learn all these kind of fundamental things that have been passed down through generations of practice, you know, trial and error. These guys aren't getting that. So I can only imagine that, first off, that's a dangerous unit to have out there because they're green and they're, co- they're surrounded by smoke and don't know where anything is. And secondly, they're even more so dangerous because they are green. They're not going to be concerned with knowing where anything is. If anything comes up to them at all that seems threatening or out of the normal of them, they're probably going to attack it. You know, if they do by chance walk into the wrong place, if they face any kind of initial volley that is really effective, it's probably going to break them. Like they're probably going to run the other direction because they can't see. Yeah, and the experience, it's very interesting to hear the experience that both of you have in terms of that 
of that learning. And during the Civil War, I know you, you guys get asked this because you study it as well. Well, how come they all marched in front rank and rear rank? And the reality is it was a carryover from the Revolution. It was how, how they were taught at West Point. When you have no ability to communicate other than seeing the flag or your, your officers' voices, you need to keep them together, et cetera. But by the end of the war, roughly late 63, 64, these guys had figured it out on their own, particularly, for example, Sherman's men, who decided, you know, of course, they all went in, they had bright brass you know, breastplates on and brass you know, this, and some of them had the Zouave, you know, they were having red, red caps and all kinds of stuff. And a lot of these guys, particularly Sherman's guys, said, mm, enough of that. So the brass was gone. They figured out something else. They didn't, you know, they didn't sharpen up there. And even Sherman, there was one frontal assault he made during his whole advance from Chattanooga down to Atlanta. So these guys had learned. They no longer attacked. They, they moved around. They did, if you want to, almost like the way that the colonials fought, you know, the more British. Hit, more hit and move. More, hit tactics. and move type stuff. So mm-hmm. they, but they, they did that on their own. So again, that, that adaptation happened even in the middle of the Civil War, particularly towards the end. Well, you got to think they're paying such a heavy price. Absolutely. For, so the motivation to figure out a way to do it better is very high. Yes. When, I mean, wouldn't you think so? You're losing thousands and thousands of guys oh, yeah. in every battle from just marching straight up to it. It's no secret that Brett and I have been friends since we were 18 and in the first year of our enlistments. Well, a few years ago, we decided that we needed to see each other with more consistency than we had been up to that point. But it would have to be a trip of some kind because we lived on opposite ends of the country. For us, there was no better way to spend our time together than being out on one of the many battlefields all across the country. We would take two trips a year, each of them just for a few days, and go park the car, get out, and walk a battlefield like Antietam or Gettysburg. And we'd have a blast. It's on one of those trips we decided to start America Fog of War. Walking America's battlefields in the footsteps of the men that fought the battle is the best way to learn the legacy of the American warrior and to really appreciate the sacrifices they made. Brett and I both still do it, and although it's usually for researching the subject matter of our show these days, it's still fun. If you're interested in following the Army of Northern Virginia's invasion into Maryland or its retreat after the defeat at Gettysburg, or Grant's 1864 Overland Campaign, then I highly recommend checking out Civil War Trails. I've been a fan of Civil War Trails and what they do since Brett and myself started doing these battlefield trips all those years ago. They're an awesome organization. They make the historical interpretation of the American warrior's legacy easier to access and enjoy for everyone. If you'd like more information on Civil War Trails and what they do and all the different sites that they have for you to explore, then go check out civilwartrails.org. Find a battlefield or a site that you want to visit and stand in the footsteps of the men and women that made this country what it is today. Another thing that I I think about too is uh, firepower, Mm -hmm. consolidated firepower, and having to keep your men massed in a formation like that. Exactly. Nowadays, we don't have to do that at all because one guy can put down just as much firepower as one of these companies right. could back then right. in the same amount of time. The first thing you want to do when you get into a gunfight is gain the fire superiority right. because that is the first step and be able to dictate what happens next. If I want to move over this way, I can move over that way if I have fire superiority. If I want to back out of the fight, I can do that if I have fire superiority. If I want to charge them, I can do that because mm-hmm. I have fire superiority of keeping their heads down. To be able to gain that kind of firepower in one concentrated place back then, you would need a much tighter grouping of a lot more men. Whereas now, you put a fire team out on the battlefield that has 20, 30 yards of dispersion in between each guy, they can still do effectively the same thing, especially with the belt-fed machine guns and all that. But you're right. There is a learning process to the whole thing. There's there's numerous things that we learned, and it can be in so many different ways. It can be in your actual battlefield tactics, like you had just mentioned, where they, you know, Sherman and his men had decided, you know, we're we're not going to just frontal assault this anymore. We'll hold them. We'll we'll hold up here. 
you know, we'll have a little line here to keep their attention we'll this flank. way, and then we'll move around and hit them from a different area that they might be that they might not be as defensively capable right, in. Right. And then you have things like you had mentioned on the uniform. There's plenty of things that we would do to our uniforms to make them more quiet mm-hmm. or not, you know, not stand out. I bet they probably started using black buttons of some kind instead well, of the did. brass Well, they did. That's one. exactly right. I mean, you had Berdan sharpshooters, which had sharps rifles, and they were extremely accurate with the sharps. They wore dark green uniforms. And they got Goodyear to make them black buttons. You know, they fought here here at Gettysburg as well, but it's that adaptation process. Exactly. I feel like I've always felt like the Union Blue was was the the least advantage in the uniform department because I, I feel like butternut and gray blends in pretty well blends in, in a little more too. although if you're a fifth new york with all the you know the zouave type stuff <laughs> that's got to be the biggest i mean of, anything red don't wear red on a battlefield yeah. lo- lots of red there lots of red it's the unit cohesion when you're talking about moving in a box mm-hmm. moving in a formation where you move as one so you know what the guy next to you exactly is going to do because mm-hmm. you're moving the same way. And if you're going to turn together, you're going to turn together the same way. Right. It's kind of like that. And then going off of the uniforms, it's uh, as much as uh, you say that, you know, and I, I can agree with you that your senses really, you become hyper vigilant all the time because you're constantly scanning, staying alert, staying alive. You can also observe that about the enemy, and the enemy Mm -hmm. observes that about you. So if your uniform is a bit different than somebody else's uniform, well, you've already made yourself a target because you're not doing the same thing as as the others. You stand out. When we were overseas, they guys for a little while were making it a habit of wearing medical shears in their flak jackets. You could see the medical shears. Corman would, Marines would, and then they started telling guys, don't do that. Even Corman, don't put your shears there. They're going to know you're a corpsman, and then they'll shoot you first. You. you know, Children used to come up to us in Afghanistan and say stuff. They'd say, doctor, and point to the corpsman. Yeah. We would think, Whoa. Well, it's because they're not dumb. They definitely know. Yeah, they're watching. And, and they're and, communicating that. And so I would be interested, does he, does uh, does Josiah talk about this since he is an officer? I know at, beginning, at the beginning of the war, up, to, up through 63, you have a lot of officers staying on horseback for a lot of these battles either behind their line or, or leading a charge, whatever the case is, a lot right. of them stay on horseback. And I feel like towards the end of the war, Grant's Overland campaign and stuff, that's almost gone right out the window. That That's not the case anymore. Yeah, they were. And, you know, being a captain, I, I, I don't see any indication that he had one either. But again... Um, his height pro- was probably a problem. <laughs> Six foot four in those days when the average guy is five seven, five eight. Yeah, probably made him a bit more of a target. He was never wounded, uh, and again, having even though he went across on the charge on May twenty second, sixty three at Vicksburg, they were in the they were in the first wave. Um, no, no indication that he ever was was really wounded, mm. but he was not. As far as I can tell, I've got no indication he was ever on horseback. That would typically be a colonel, would colonel, probably have lieutenant that. colonel, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about him not being wounded on a charge like that, especially well in this war period and the battles that he's going to yes. fight in. I've been to combat. I've had close calls. I've had many, mm-hmm. many close calls. But it still amazes me in battles like D Day, you know, the first wave on Omaha Beach, the first wave on on Iwo Jima, or at Vicksburg, or or in Pickett's charge here at Gettysburg, or uh, one of the one of the numerous charges at Petersburg, mm-hmm. you have guys that'll go through that and not get a scratch on them. Right, and it blows my mind. It it really does because you think about how much is flying through the air in those moments in time. How how much lead is just? I feel like it's so dense it makes it hard to see. You know, I mean, it yeah. gets to a point like there's so much stuff flying through the air, it makes it hard to see. How do these guys make it through those situations without a scratch? I would think about myself often coming back from Afghanistan. I don't know how I did that without getting wounded yeah, or killed. Right, right, you know? right. But on a day like that where it's just the casualty numbers are astronomically higher than, a, than your usual battle because of how much is being expended in your direction – it's it's a it's a mind blowing thing to me. Yeah, and how open you are, and in you know in the battles here, how compact you are, uh, and as you note, the tactics had really caught up with the technology because we put guys together close together during the revolution because you had to be within 40, 50 yards with those weapons and right. had to group people to hit the side of a barn. Well, <laughs> all of a sudden now you have a weapon that's accurate to three hundred yards. Of course, with the smoke, you couldn't always see it. But right. That hadn't changed much until these guys, as we said changed it on their own and you do think about some of that how did and i'm sure they did how did i ever get through that day you may never know i couldn't imagine seeing one of those days in person to begin with just the because the thing i mean most people know this but war is chaotic Mm -hmm. it's super chaotic especially if you're in a really intense gunfight and we've had had 
quite a few of those sure. with multiple machine gun positions on us and all that. But it's super chaotic, especially when guys are starting to get wounded. And for some guys, their first battle in, in you know, in the Northern Army is going to be at Vicksburg making that charge. Mm -hmm. Some guys, their first battle is going to be Gettysburg. Some guys, their first time into combat is going to be the crater at Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And I think about how much more chaotic that is than anything that you and I did. And then also putting on top of that, brand new green troops having to absorb that chaos in time. The Like you don't get any processing time. It's just happening to you. And like I've read accounts when they talk about, because there's all kinds of different rounds you can fire from artillery at the time. You've got the canister rounds, right. you've got a round shot, you've got spherical case, all these different things, shell, all these different things that you can fire. Um, and like some of the, like they were, I read a quote the other day talking about, uh, I'll talk about two of them. I read one about round shot, um, just the solid shot taken, mm -hmm. taking people's legs, arms, right. heads right off. That would be unbelievable to see something like that. A guy in front of you and then all of a sudden, boom. Like their head is gone. Just what it sounds like, too. Right. Yeah. I mean, when we have IEDs in our era, and, and that can happen, you know, it usually does happen right out of nowhere. But nothing like nothing like one minute they're in front of you talking, and the next minute their head is gone. Mm -hmm. That is a different level. Like that's a different thing. And then you then another quote I heard was about canister shot. And first off, the first interesting thing that I read in this quote was talking about how you could feel the warmth of the shot from the cannon because they would usually be close enough. Like you could feel the heat come off right, of it. Right, absolutely. It would cause the heat, all of a sudden the change in heat would cause the smoke to swirl mm -hmm. in a circle wherever the blast was concentrated. So smoke already just even more so terrible. But they talk about hearing those iron balls and they're like the size of a golf ball, these iron balls they have in there. In Sometimes rounds. double canister. Double canister as well, which is even worse. It's almost 60 of those. Depends balls. on the size of the gun too. The larger the gun, you do double, you get more. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, there've been descriptions of that that they have a, here at Gettysburg, a crowd of Confederates, you know, coming up on Pickett's charge and double canister from Cowan's and, they guys said all they saw was a pink mist after that. Right. They, yeah. You have guys talk about here, and I can hear my buddy's bones breaking yeah. from from the those balls impacting, like hearing them break a leg, hearing them break, break a shoulder. Yeah. Uh, just horrific, crazy, crazy stuff. It's incredible, your observations in combat, because um, you could even hear in the middle of all this, imagine in a firefight you may have a jam or a misfire, and, it, and you pull that trigger, and it doesn't fire, but it just goes mm -hmm. click. But in the middle of all that chaos, you can hear that sound of that firing pin hit nothing. It clicks. Yeah. And the same way you would say, and there's cannons going off, and you can hear my buddy's bones breaking. That's absolutely insane. And it goes back to your sense of heightened. I mean, all of a sudden, everything's elevated. Mm -hmm. Your sense of smell, your your sound, your eyesight, and you're right. going to see that. You're going to hear you know, that, that horrific you know, attempt. Now, conversely, you have soldiers here and in other battles who would pick up their Enfield or their Springfield and load as they were supposed to and put in the powder, put in a round, ram it down, put on a cap, pull it, nothing happens, don't realize it didn't go off, put in another one, and just keep, keep reloading going. on All top of a sudden of they have seven rounds in there, which has happened, and they found, they've had battlefield pickups where you pick it up and there's seven rounds wow. down down the barrel because they didn't realize it didn't go off with all the sounds and the, all the smoke. Just you can't tell. No clue. You can't tell. They had no clue that it didn't go off. And I think that when you and I are fighting, it's very rare that we're like shoulder to shoulder with another guy, you know? Right. They have large amounts of men on on shoulder to shoulder with them. There's exactly. a lot more going on, or like right in their immediate proximity. The thing about fighting like that, because the Marine Corps is huge on close order drill, it's like one of the things. It's one of the main things you do while you're at boot camp is is work on this close order drill, and you have two drill inspections you do when you're there. And one of the things about being in formation like that and having to work in a formation like that in a weird way because both are team efforts modern combat the way we fight now and how they were fighting at the time especially early in the war they're both team efforts but there's something much more singular about having to do it in a large formation you have to be as if you're one machine mm -hmm. and you're just you're a tiny little piece of that machine that you just need to stay you need to stay there and do your one job if you need to, if you need to turn you know to a 45 degree angle that's what you do and you're in a lot of it is you're like a, a link in a chain. You just kind of, you follow along what everybody else is doing, where it, there's a lot more autonomy in modern-day combat. Yes, I um, agree. And, and, and a lot more uh, 
a lot more of the individual trying to make the best decision as I need to be in this position so I can cover them here. Exactly. And I have this field of fire. Whereas a little bit of space as well is probably going to allow you to hear things. But you are right about picking up on things in combat. You hone in on so many different things. And I think it's honestly because there's so many intense things that your brain is trying to take in at one time. It's like your mind just grabs onto things almost like life preservers. Like, oh, that's weird. I'm going to remember that. Oh, this is weird. I'm going to remember that. But it won't remember other things. The fog of war. It's fascinating to me that I can have a conversation with another buddy we were on our deployment with. We could be talking about the same gunfight. We could have been, you know, almost right next to each other. But he's going to remember things so much differently, or at least different aspects of that fight that I might not even remember happening. Which I think is the reason why we continue to study. We're here in Gettysburg. is the reason we continue to study because, as I've said to someone, there is not a Gettysburg story. There are 170,000 Gettysburg stories because right, you've right. got roughly 95,000 Union troops who are here. You've got 70,000 Confederates. You have the story of the civilians. And as you know, and it's a great point, someone's going to remember something, and the guys talk about that. Somebody says, for some reason, I noticed this rabbit take off out of the thicket. Mm -hmm. It just struck him, as you say, it's just, boy, this is really odd. Here we are marching in this rabbit's head now. And so you've, you've got, you know, 170, 180,000 Gettysburg stories because each person who was here pulled something a little bit different, even if they're within five feet of each other. Right. It's crazy the way that works. I'd be curious, as the war goes on and he gets a little more hard and Josiah does, I'd be, I'd be interested to see, can you tell that he is going through the hardening process in his letters to Jenny? Um, a little bit. I kind of tracked it with how he viewed the Confederates and his anger and his sometimes bordering on hatred for the Confederates ebbed and flowed. When someone from his unit was killed, they had, we were talking earlier about a surgeon, the assistant surgeon who he knew from, from back in Monmouth was killed by a sharpshooter perhaps by artillery. That seemed to be the epitome of his anger and his hatred, and it then tended to subside. And again, I think it's, he talked a lot about asking for God's forgiveness. He talked, and there was a lot of discussions about whose side God is on in the war. Each side claimed God was, you know, was with them. They would camp within sometimes a couple miles of each other. They would, interesting, some of them made note that they heard the same hymns being sung in the Confederate camp as in their <laughs> camp, which drove home right. the commonalities at the same time that they were at war. But for him, it ebbed and flowed. I got to believe there was that there was some hardening, it w which allowed him to survive, which allowed him to look out for his men. But I think being a being an officer changed it a bit, but um, there was certainly that change in how he viewed the Confederates, and as we said earlier, how he viewed people back home who, who he viewed as not being as loyal as they should. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking for both of us, but I, I'm assuming I'm just assuming this on your behalf here. What's that? I, uh, I noticeably, I mean, there was already a pretty good level of content for Taliban when we deployed to mm -hmm. Afghanistan, yep. but your level of hatred for them really does escalate until a certain point, and, and I think that's about the time you start to come home, you start to look at the Taliban. Now, you don't ever want to be their friend, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you're, they're not going to be your buddies, but you have a weird respect for them because you fought them so much. Mm -hmm. I almost equate it to, like, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. If you saw them in the work up to the fight, during the fight, it is very clear they hate each other. But then the minute they're done fighting each other, they have nothing but positive things to say about one another because... They're bringing the best. Well, first off, they're both in that miserable experience together, even if you know, they're, they're each other's dance partners. Right. And the other thing, you know, the other part of it being that in a weird way, they are bringing out the best aspects of you, yeah. you know, um, and they're also bringing out the most violent aspects of you, too. But that being said, when I talk about the Taliban now, if I would have talked about the Taliban when we were in country, I would have I would have done nothing but talk crap about them the whole time. Now, if I talk about the Taliban, I'm a lot more logical in my views on them. They're very capable fighters. Some of them are very good fighters that have been doing what they were doing for a long time. You start to take it in a different way. And it's interesting. When was the time frame that their doctor was killed? Josiah's doctor was killed. It was at, it was at Vicksburg. So okay, so June of 63. So not long before he's, he's got about a year left yes. before he gets out. And you say that he, his view kind of starts to recede from that hatred from that point. I think that's probably what is happening there. I mean, it, that's what I would assume, just reading it as somebody that went through it myself. That's kind of the vibe I take on it. And again, I don't mean to confuse the fact that you have a weird respect for the, the dance partner there in, in the battlefield as meaning that you find their qualities or anything about them. 
you're not respecting it as if that's something you want to be or you want to be a part of. It's a common respect among warfighters. Like you, you respect their capabilities and what they were able to bring out of you. If that makes sense, you acknowledge him as a worthy adversary. That's right. probably the only right. way to say that. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's got to be tough for them because they were all once countrymen, and uh, sure. yeah, especially the officers, and went to school together and a lot of commissioned did. together. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very unique. It's a different thing than what we're dealing with today. Yeah, absolutely. That absolutely. is the, that's another aspect. Yeah, I, like that's one thing I could never really wrap my head around is, that, you know, our enemy is very different than us that we were fighting in, in, in mm -hmm. Afgan Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the enemy these guys were fighting were, I mean... Many cases, sp friends. Right. And in, in, in 1861, 1862, a year or two before this, were the same countrymen... Absolutely. You know, that, that the guy fighting next to him at that moment is. So it's it's a very weird dynamic, one that I, I hope my, I'm pretty confident we'll never have to face Let's that hope again. Let's right. hope and, not. And... <laughs> and it had to be super. It had to be a super confusing, emotionally confusing thing to overcome, and and challenging on a moral level, so many times. I think that's why you get so many of these little stories about guys swapping cigarettes, like tobacco oh, yeah. and 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 coffee, and you know, uh, there's a lot of the, especially in a conventional war like this. Uh, I think this is why this happens in World War One with the with the Christmas um, yes, exactly. encounter there they had. But there's a lot of this feeling among the guys that are in the junior ranks, like, you know, we're just the cannon fodder. The guys that are mad at each other, the guys that are running the countries right now are in charge of these militaries. Yeah. Like, we're just here just, right. I, don't, I don't know you, you know, why am I here fighting you? They kind of stuck in this misery together kind of a thing. And I think you see that a few, you know, at least a few times throughout the Civil War as well. Well, and he had, he had one of those encounters at Vicksburg where, where they kind of got in, they exchanged, they came out, you know. Um, and then it got ugly to where they, they were digging the trenches and it was kind of like, okay, now that's over, no more talking. They were literally throwing rattlesnakes over the trenches Yikes. at each other. Oh, and, wow. Oh, yeah, it was it was an ugly fight. I got to tell you, they would have got me with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I hate snakes, man. They'd have got me with that. Bullets, all right. Snakes, Right, I'll take so bullets much. any day. Snakes, no thank you. I'm curious from Jenny's perspective, do you see any kind of transformation happening with her throughout the letters? Interesting. She's a, you know, 19 year old when the war starts, and as I said earlier, it, you know, some days she seems like she's twice her age. Some days she's like a junior high kid. You know, when are you coming home? Because yeah. I, I detected in the letters that there was another. She had another suitor as mm. one of the other officers of the company, um, and you know, for her, uh, you, you don't see huge changes. I think both. Both she and Josiah are grappling with the fact, well, one, she had a brother in the 77th Illinois who was involved at the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, which mm. is December 62. Might have been those bayous and those ravines you were running when you played down in Vicksburg. Uh, and meanwhile, their, their father, who had been a member of the Whig Party, turned Republican. He was a House member in Illinois as a Republican. And then in 1862, he was elected as a Peace Democrat. I think they were grappling with the politics of the time. I detect that, you know, Peoria was very much politically split, center center part of Illinois. And I mean, Southern Illinois had huge Southern sympathies there. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Alton, Illinois was a hotbed of secessionism. Some of the counties wanted to break off on their own. So I think she was grappling with that, how, how her father, who went on the floor of the Illinois Senate in January of 63 after Lincoln's emancipation proclamation and he made the following statement if all of hell was distilled to liquid fire and poured down his throat it would all be altogether too good for him he was adamantly <laughs> well, that's opposed. some hate right there that's some hate and so i think they were grappling with that and i think she was a little unsure about where you know where her where her place was with her with her boyfriend in in the union army as an officer her brother in the union army who stayed a democrat by all indications her father is a peace democrat trying mm -hmm. to navigate those political turmoil issues on the home front had to be difficult for her. especially for a young person yeah, yeah it's uh, absolutely. very questionable times yeah just like nowadays you're trying to in that especially in that time frame you're trying to make yourself the person that you want to be like right. you you're trying to do you're trying to you're trying to get your morals to line up with the best thing you can possibly you know you can you can come up with from the situation you're dealt and um and you're very i don't know you're 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 
you're very moldable at that age as well, depending Absolutely. on what you're hearing every day. So, so yeah, I could see that being the case. Now, did they, when he goes home in 63, this, mm-hmm. right? He goes home for a brief time in 63. He does. He went home to uh, kind of recruit, you know, for the, you know, for the regiment. They had to, you know, kind of try and restock. And that's, that's when he got ill in like November 63. Yeah. Is there any indication at all that their relationship had changed after that visit home? It's funny you say that. I, I, I suspect they got engaged at that point. Okay. And okay. I think that that's what led to the letters taking on, uh, uh, discussions of a more intimate nature i think which i think also led him to say i'm not i don't want to be captured with these yeah there were he he never said i'm so happy we're engaged we're going to get married just things he said Mm. you read between the lines and again the fact that none of her letters from 1864 exist says to me something fundamentally changed when he was home right and i think that that's what happened well, good man. He got he went home and, and got to work. He made sure he, he, he did. locked that up. He did. Because, listen, you know, that's a thing uh, guys back then and guys nowadays have to deal with is a lot of guys will come into the military now with, with girlfriends or and they'll either marry them right off the bat or they'll, you know, they're trying to make mm-hmm. it last until after the, the, first or the first deployment or at least the first four years or whatever the case is. And most of them do not make it that distance. Mm-hmm. Um, being away from home, even if you are communicating every day, you're not there, you know, and there are other people that are, and it can be a very challenging, uh, yeah, it's, it's exactly. challenging for, for, for very seasoned couples, couples that have been together for a long time and mm-hmm. are older and married. It can be challenging for them for an 18, 19 year old. It's almost impossible. Right. You know, they, they are, they're so involved with what's going on around them. It's very hard to keep their interests, uh, you know, thousands of miles yeah. away. It is, and um, her, her benefit is that she at least had, you know, family structure and support. I, you know, they were well-to-do. Mm-hmm. You look at pictures of her, and I've, I have found out what the net worth of her father was, which by the time was pretty good. Um, contrast that with some of what other folks, and still to this day have to. Someone goes in, you know, someone gets deployed, you know, today. They've got three kids back home. Um, you know, they might not have you know, the, the spouts might not have family support. I mean, back then you had women whose husband joined maybe from the upper Midwest and they're back home to run, trying to run the farm with four kids. Oh, right. Listen, it's, the do. women that are married to guys that are in the military deploying like this and taking care of families and continuing on, they're just as much a part of like the sacrifice that oh, the absolutely. guys fighting are. It's, it's always blown my mind. I think about, well, you're going to have to talk more on this, but I think about, you know, your wife and, and mm. a few of the other guys' wives just being back at home, taking care of kids and doing everything by themselves while we're, you know, and, and listen, it's not like they can just call you if they need something. A lot of the times right. they, they, a lot of the times the phones weren't even turned on in Afghanistan because they'll, they turn them off every time someone gets wounded or mm-hmm. killed. And we had very few windows where they would be open for us. It's, it's just, you're, you're taking on everything that, you know, that everything that's involved with not just the people there, but also with the one deployed right. as well and, and handling right. it. I mean, what do you, what do you? Well, yeah, I think about that. You also have to consider what war are we talking about? Does this war affect most Americans or is it like almost today where maybe it didn't affect it almost everybody like it did during the civil war? Of course, everybody was affected and knew somebody that was there or involved in it in some way or not, or, or not. But um, when it comes to like, Okay, being a young man in, in, in the Marine Corps in combat, we grow up very quickly. And mm-hmm. I think uh, my wife being at home and doing what she was doing as, as the deployments went on and the, and the family grew and, and just uh, things changing in life, uh, she also grew up very quickly from mm-hmm. a young age as well. And it went from, uh, of course, it affects her because I'm there, um, but maybe a, another tough part of that would be maybe her friends and people that are not involved in it have no idea what yeah. she's living through and I what know. she's going through and, and having to deal with, like you said, Sammy, where there's nobody to contact if you have an issue. Or, Of course, you have your own parents and your own family and all, but you're really navigating this. A wife, without a, a your bride, partner. is navigating through life without their their partner or their spouse or something of that nature. And then you have to, when you if you have children while you're gone, you have to come back and... Uh, really reintroduced to them who you you have to get to know them they have to get to know you again that was something That's 
Do you love America Fog of War and want more of it? If so, Brett and I would love it if you became a member of the America Fog of War Patreon. Visit AmericaFogOfWar.com and follow the link Become a Member located in the menu at the top of the homepage and pick from one of our three membership subscription options. As a member, you can enjoy ad-free early access to all of our free episodes, like this one, as well as gain access to not one, but two extra episodes a month. Your membership subscriptions are what enable us to bring you the content you love. Help us grow this podcast and become part of the team today at AmericaFogOfWar.com. And that's one of the real, I mean, you guys have hit on something that to me is one of the real cultural issues we have in this country these days. I mean, whether it was a civil war where everybody knew somebody who was in, you were affected in different ways. You know, in, you know, most cases, if you're in the South, you might have literally had the invading army camped in your backyard. Here in this right. area, not so much other than July, although Chambersburg was hit three times. Um, but what we have today is there's this, Instead of being, and even in World War II, everybody knew somebody and there was more of a all in this, where there was this broad-based not only support but contact with the military and the sacrifices that the military make, it is now what I would call much more vertical than horizontal. We have military families. I mean, my dad was, was a Korean War vet. My wife's dad was in uh, Cold War. Um, I, I was not in. By the time I got out, they, weren't, they were not They were shedding people in 1970. Right. Five, six, seven. Right. They wanted people out, but there's very little, as you note, this contact and understanding because we tend to have military families that I said that are linear rather than a connection to everybody in the community. Right. And that's sad because, as you note, people don't understand the true sacrifices that are made, and we're losing that as a society, not just an understanding of it, but an appreciation of it and a gratitude for the service that, that that people like the two of you have given. And it's it's a sad cultural issue, I think. It is, and I and I blame it on the fact that we don't have any more kind of John Wayne genre movies, you know? Like they like that's one of those things that that is as corny as, you know, the the good guy, you know, the good guys wearing, you know, spotless white cowboy outfit and and the, but there is something about that that connects that connects your history also to a set of beliefs and ideals. And and even, you know, like the, the JFK quote, you know, ask not what your country right. can do for you, ask instead what you can do for your country. Yeah. That that whole thing can be reinforced in so many different ways. It's one of the goals of this podcast is to reignite that because, again, also that that is tied into uh, there's a guy named Sebastian Younger. I'm and, familiar with him. OK, he, he did the Restrepo documentaries mm -hmm. and all that. He's got a book called Tribe. Have you ever read it? I've not read that one. I've read a lot of his others, though. He's he's great. He's a mm -hmm. great newsman. He's he's a great author. And this book, Tribe, uh, in a in a multitude of different ways, covers this concept that he was running into. He would he had checked back in with the the guys from Restrepo. This is like a year or two after they had been back, and many of them have gotten out. And he kept asking them, you know, how they were doing, and they were all pretty you know pretty miserable, and and they all for the most part were saying they wish they could go back mm -hmm. right and and part of that is the 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 purpose aspect i i believe but sebastian younger also makes this point that up to a very recent time in our history if there was a war on your your grandfather had been in a war your dad had been in a war mm -hmm. your brothers have probably been in a war your your mom was working in a factory down right. the road to support the war your pastor had been to war that or in some way was affected by the efforts that yes. your country was making in a war and so everybody, when you come back from from combat at that time, it's a little easier to integrate back into the populace because they get it. Like the same things that are important to you are going to be important to them, right? You don't get held up on all this small stuff, this very much first world kind of issues. You you really have a, a, a firm grasp that is shared among just about everybody of what the important things are and what you should be concerned over and what you shouldn't be concerned over. And there's a tribal sense to that. Nowadays, you don't have that because of, like you said, it's more instead of being linear, it's, you know, it's, it's up the graph instead of horizontal across the graph. And now you have very dispersed and condensed populations yes, of absolutely. military families that are coming back out of that situation into a civilization or into a tribe that really can't relate to them in any way other than saying thank you for what you did, yes. which is always appreciated. I'm not like trying to belittle that, but 
like what like I, I remember getting out of the Marine Corps and going to college for the first time and sitting down in a classroom and thinking there is not a chance I'm going to come back to this class because I could not relate to anything any mentality anybody had I mean even the teacher I couldn't relate to the teacher right. as well they were all the all these people were so concerned with you know who's who's got this haircut and and what this famous person is doing and I I thought there are so many more important things going on out there in the world than this crap we're talking about in this class and it is an interesting concept. Sebastian Yeager goes into this in, in greater detail. He uses examples yeah. of, of um, you know, like these frontier families where the, the, you know, a daughter would be kidnapped by Indians and then be rescued by white sheriffs and then would run away from white civilization to go live with the Indians again because it was a much more tribal feel to the whole, the whole thing. And, and he does all this to tie it into PTSD and its effects on uh, soldiers and it's fascinating to me but i'd have to i would have to agree 100 percent with everything you were saying well you know you bring up an interesting point on movies and like you i grew up watching all of them whether it was sands of iwo jima or you know the longest day yes. and you know all of those and i can tell you from a movie perspective the last year I watched anything, actually it's the last time I have ever watched an award show, particularly the Academy Awards, was 1989. And the reason is this, in 1990, I, uh, I guess it was 89, I did some of the filming for the movie Glory. And a phenomenal movie, you know, you can always nitpick over some of the accuracy. Oh, but it's a great movie. It's it a is great, great movie. great movie. It wasn't, the, the only nomination was for Denzel Washington for Best Supporting Actor, and he deserved every bit of it. He that and scene where he, were that phenomenal. That scene where he does the tear down his eye. Oh, my whipped. God, It's phenomenal. Man. It's incredible. If you watch that scene and don't get goosebumps and almost cry Absolutely. yourself, you Absolutely. might not be a human. Right? And <laughs> I, you know, there was a great column by George Will, you know, you know, conservative commentator who said it was a travesty that Glory was not nominated for an Academy Award because it's this group of men who see a challenge, who see people who need to be uplifted, in this case, freed from slavery, who took it upon themselves to join and do this. And he said, Hollywood will not recognize that. They want dependency. Mm -hmm. They don't want people who with self-sufficiency, with ideals, and it hit me hard on that. In fact, I remember at the time having a conversation a couple years after that with my neighbor who I said, the, the people, and I apologize to anybody on this podcast who disagrees, the people in Hollywood don't share our values of what we're sitting here talking about today. They don't see, I won't say nobility in war, but a nobility of the cause that causes you to right. go and fight for an ideal that was in the movie Glory. Right. They will not recognize that. They will not recognize the the value of people who will take that up. They won't, because many of them now, particularly now, don't recognize the value of the ideals that founded this country. We're not a perfect country. We're a great country. We're not a perfect country. And as we talk about the Civil War, we have to live with what I heard one person state, which was the birth defect of the American Republic, slavery. We're still working through that. Right, right. And we I, are a great country, but a not a perfect thing country. To, what a great thing to call that, because yeah. it really it's it's from the forming of the country. It really where the is. Problem persi- it's like, a birth defect. It is. It is. 100%. And it, and, well said. Um, I, I would have to, I mean, I would have to agree with you at least to it, like a certain extent, because you look at a movie like Platoon. Mm-hmm. I'm going to use Platoon. Platoon's probably the best one to do this with. It comes out in the 80s at some point, yeah. sometime in the 80s. Yeah. You And then before that, you have the era of John Wayne and Sansa Iwo Jima, The Longest Day and all that, right. all those films. And there's a there's obviously a drastic shift in the way the story gets told. Absolutely. Now, there are some benefits to that shift because you get the realness of how mean war is and how evil right. war can be. But you don't get any carryover of the moralistic side you can see in war as well and all the great things that you see humans do on a regular basis or these incredible feats of of you know, fortitude and courage that you see just repeated time and time again to do the right thing and always trying to, you know, like... Essentially, you're making a movie about a, a bunch of guys, and and in some in in some cases, women as well. At least nowadays, women as well. That um, they have, you know, they have raised their hand. They volunteered. They say, "I will go. I will go handle this on our behalf, right. so that others can stay here and they don't have to." Like, who's going to go? I will go. I will be the one to go and do that. And it's um, sometimes multiple times. And sometimes yeah. multiple times, and they'll sacrifice life, limb, and body to do so. Mm-hmm. And it just seems as though nowadays 
people want in their movies. They want the the darker side of things. The Joker. Have you seen the Joker, the newest one with Joaquin Phoenix? No. I mean, it's it's a, it's a phenomenal piece of acting. It's it's truly incredible. But it's a movie about a bad guy and how a bad guy is developed. And and although the character has moments of you can be sympathetic with, eventually he turns into this crazy villain. And people want that more so. It seems as though at least at least in Hollywood, they want to create that more so because they feel like it gives more drama to the story they, or whatever. Yeah, they the, want to do the ambiguities. The I right. get it. Right. But but I'll tell you, you know, maybe one of the last things, last war movies that I saw that didn't have a negative overlook to it because although, I mean, obviously war is negative. We don't, we're not sitting here trying to promote Absolutely. war is a good idea, but there are good things that come from war. Yes. And, and there are things, there's honorable moments. And one of the last movies that really did that for me was Saving Private Ryan. Yes. Um, or, or like Band of Brothers or The Pacific, like, you know, any of those genre uh, of movies Tom Hanks and, and Steven Spielberg make And they've together. done a good job with those, no, and, no question And about because it. you still have the good guy making the right, de- like you mm-hmm. have the guys making the right decision. You have something that you would want to emulate we're getting real deep here, but this is geared towards like the younger mind, right? Like that's who you're trying. Not only are you trying to convince this to the audience of, of adults, but I was, I was younger when, when Saving Private Ryan came out and I can remember watching that and thinking, you know, I want to be like Tom Hanks. Yeah. One day I will do that, mm-hmm. you know, and one day I'll go to war and I'm going to hold myself up to a higher standard because I want to, I want to be that. I want, you know what I mean? And, uh, well, you had a baseline, right? Like I knew what, I knew what, I knew what right looked like, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a shame because you don't really get that, that often in war movies now. Now there was a little bit of a resurgence of, of, um, the movie about Chris Kyle, uh, American American Sniper. Sniper. You know, they, they, they do a good job of trying to, uh, of trying to. Movie, have a balance yeah of, and the of movie we were soldiers was pretty good from, right it's one of the you know ones that wasn't complete propaganda against vietnam and the military right i think establishing a an interest in history at a young age like you said you were 11 when you're in gettysburg and mm-hmm. just just studying it at a young age you really develop a baseline of what our american values are and why we fight for the things that we fight for because you look throughout history and realize this is why they were fighting, and this is why we're fighting now, and this is what we're going to look towards in the future. Right. We got to establish that baseline, and, right? And always stay a- along and, that. And look, the, I mean, the movies we watched growing up that they weren't the most accurate. That that they were in many cases inaccurate with regards to many of the Japanese, et cetera. Um, you know. Uh, uh, the Green Berets during Vietnam was completely inaccurate. It was a propaganda piece. I understand all that. But then we went completely the other way. I'm not a huge fan of the platoon. When you look at a lot of these, it was like everybody who went to Vietnam, all they did was dope and kill civilians. Right. And Which is not the case. You have so many case. guys over there doing, right. I mean, Absolutely. amazing jobs. I, I had on the relatives ground. who were, you know, who were in Vietnam, and uh, that's that's not the case. And we've then for a while we we tried to take a little more, as you know, of an equilibrium in terms terms of how we look at it but um i you know i still think that we've we've got to change the culture about how we how we view military in this country well and it all falls back to honestly the american warrior and and, and this is not because you and i are in this class of people i truly believe that the american warrior is the greatest warrior the, the world has ever known right it's accomplished more than any of the other great warriors no in question. the world's history and it has done more good for humanity than any other military has in the history of the world it's such an incredible lineage to have to get to be a part of it was something that i am so thankful that i had to look forward to growing up and to work towards and to know that i could i could be a part of that one day if i did the right thing i didn't get involved with drugs i did good in school and i passed what i should and then i showed up and i did what i said i was going to do you know if I, I i knew if i if i met those requirements i could i could also be a part of this lineage and you can't control you know when a war comes up you can't control when a war ends but you can control what you do with yourself trying to live up to the standards of the people that have been before you and 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 it's 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 the purpose in this show we this is a dedication to the warrior the, the mm-hmm. american warrior and we try right. to we try to very much put that forward it's not any secret that we i put i mean we put this out as well because I, I want to have something out there that can motivate the next generation of American right, warriors. Right. If I, if this show existed when I was a kid, I would be, I would be so about it. I would, uh, I would yes. have loved this. You know what I mean? This would, because 
you can't go to you don't learn this in school I, I not at all we don't teach this and and you do I mean you learn the things you need to learn I'm not trying to you know dump on the American education system here but there's not a big war war focus when it comes to ed, when it comes to what you learn as far as American history goes you have early American history which is up to uh, which is up to the end of the Civil War and then the next one starts with Reconstruction or is it the beginning of the Civil War? Then it's... It's usually post-Civil War Reconstruction, 1877 roughly, and then you go forward And then from to, there to where yeah. we are now, Cold War, that kind of stuff. And they just don't have the time in a year or two years to, to squeeze in all this. I get that, but there are so many valuable things to understand. If you if you understood the history, you know, the, America's history when it comes to war and the history of the American warrior and the battles that were fought and how much sacrifice has been given in the efforts that they were given those sacrifices for your appreciation for where you're at, you know, in time, well, as, as well as in, in the world, you, there's no way you can't, you can't, you can't help it. It's going to skyrocket. You have to be appreciative of what, of, of where we're at and what we have. And I mean, in that sense, I have to agree with you. And, and, and like I said, that's why we, that's why we try to do this. Well, it is critical. It's why people, and, and I hate to see people who forget what Memorial Day is about. When I you know, was still at the chamber, I would send something and I would send out a, there was a little meme and it's a picture of, you know, of, of D-Day and the guy's going in in the first wave. And it said, um, you know, when you're off on Monday, I want you to remember this. And the caption under the meme was, uh, your beach day brought to you by their beach day. Yeah, it's powerful. It's true, and it's the and truth. It's true. And it is. And it, there was a great quote that uh, it's attributed to Colin Powell, and I had met him once at a f- function we had. I wish I had asked him. And someone was saying all the U.S. military is doing is trying to get more land, and his answer was the only land we've ever asked for is enough to bury our dead. Wow. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty heavy answer. And it's, you know, it's true. I mean, I know I know the military needs funding, and I know the military needs all kind of other stuff, but really— they don't ask for much, considering mm. what they they give us on a regular basis and have through, since the. St- Listen, we wouldn't even have the country if it wasn't for an Amer- the American warrior. We right? would not, and people need to understand that, that funding levels are below uh, historically where they've been. And in my view, um, get asked a lot about what government means and what the role of government is. To me, first and foremost, is to keep us safe, which means protecting us as a country, and it is without a doubt, it is the fundamental priority role in my view of what this federal government needs to be doing and they yeah. need they and people like you need the resources to do that job yeah and and you know i mean the one the one thing i'm confident in is i don't know if we've strayed far enough away that that if, a, if another world war came up i believe that most americans would feel responsible enough towards the country to want to go and do what they could yeah. um I would hope. That being said, I don't know if the carrots and sticks, the cultural carrots and sticks are lined up in a way that we get the same result that we would with the generation from World War II. They'd have to line up real fast. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Because, you know, the, the, the way they, or the, or the, or, or the Civil War generation, um, they, you know, societally, they had different carrots and sticks and they thought of, you know what they thought of honor we might not think of as being honorable nowadays or at least as a as right. a majority right um but that's the thing about cultural influences is they can be influenced one direction but they can also be influenced back in another and and not that we're going to have any great success on that you know i i don't know i don't we're not going to be a joe rogan level podcast and change you know change the minds of millions of listeners on a weekly basis but i do hope that we get out enough information to to at least interest someone else enough in it to maybe where they take it to the next level i think it is a pendulum and i think what you guys are doing is absolutely critical because the pendulum has swung too far away from traditional values again i'm not sitting here saying we are a perfect country i'm saying we are a great country because of the ideals we're founded on and because of the things that people like the two of you have done over the years and i'm hoping we can get that pendulum to swing back with people listening to this and thinking about and reflecting upon this because we we don't teach this enough in schools we don't teach civics and the and the essential nature of volunteerism and commitment to ideals uh, those are absolutely critical well thankfully uh and i know you can agree with me here some been very thankful to uh walk amongst giants had the privilege to walk amongst some of the smartest people 
when traditionally, if you think about the infantry, you don't think of the <laughs> smartest people. But here we are 10 years out of the Marine Corps, and, and uh, I know quite a few guys that uh, were great infantry Marines, great people, and now they're doctors, nurses, absolutely, whatever, whatever they're doing in their life, absolutely. successful and yeah. smart and, and good at it. And uh, I know there's a lot of people still out there like that, of course, and we've we've uh, walked among them. Yes. So I know it's, they're out there. It's quite a it's quite a class to to be associated with. I feel like sometimes I didn't I I don't belong in it completely. You know what I mean? Like it it's a it's a you it's a a class with with like you said giants as you know as as many of its members and 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 personality giants and and moral giants and and people that have people that have been willing to sacrifice things far more than what I sacrificed. Um, one of the things that pulls that into sharp focus, have you seen the video they just released for the first time ever, video footage of a guy conducting the actions that wins him the Medal of Honor? He he gets it posthumously. Is so, this the one who just received it? or uh, It ha wasn't that long ago. Okay. It, it, right. it, it's in a mountain. It's on the side of a mountain in Afghanistan. Okay. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable to I watch. I have to look for that. Um, Me too. I have to look for that. And listen, it's from like a satellite planes. They also got the big freaking like hand of God guns on them. Anyways, uh, it's from one of those. It's it's from a okay. it, like the video footage is coming from a plane way off. Wow. Um, and it's you know it's infrared, so it's black and white like um for the most part. But uh, it's unbelievable to watch because you can also see the muzzle flashes very clearly and what wow. the guy does is, is unbelievable and if you haven't seen it uh it really pulls into sharp focus exactly mm -hmm. what you're sacrificing those kind of guys are sacrificing and what they're facing when they sacrifice it yeah i was always blown away by watching you know 18 year old mm -hmm. kids in marja that's the most dangerous place on earth at the time uh, they've been They've been there for three months already, and they've been getting into a gunfight every single day. Mm. They got guys getting wounded, and they're losing their buddies. They're not really sleeping. They're also standing post. They've been eating MREs, maybe one MRE a day. Some of them haven't been getting any packages from home. Uh, they have all kind of family problems going on back home. The girlfriend might have just left them, whatever the case is. But every morning, they'd wake up, and they'd put their stuff on and they go right back out on do. a patrol, yeah. and they'd usually do it with a smile on. Yeah. And And in a situation where most people would never want to go back yeah. out that wire again. They do it repeatedly time and time again. So, but listen, that's, that's brings me to this. That's another reason why people need to read your book because it's the same thing. It is. It's, it's the same as it is now back then. And especially for you combat vets out there, it's, it's mind blowing to read some of these firsthand accounts from these guys that are that are fighting back in the mid nineteenth century and realize how similar things really are. The language is different. Yes. You know, there's there's some workarounds there, but truthfully, it doesn't take long before you're absolutely connected in a in a way really no one else can be connected to these guys and their story because it's exactly like what you were and, doing. And and what you value is the same. You right. See that commonality. Right. So where can we where can people find your book if they want to? It's on Amazon. You can get it from the publisher Savas Beatty. It's on Amazon. Um, you know, both of those the hard copies sold out. Fortunately, we got to that a couple oh, of years cool. ago. Good, very good. I wound up uh, the, the soft cover came out uh, literally the, uh, I think the month before COVID hit. So it's I've got I've got a whole bunch of those that I bought there. Okay. And just, so we've we've got all of those. So they're still out there. Awesome, awesome. And for the, I, I'm going to say this in the intro to the show. I have a little intro that I do, but mm -hmm. just one more time for the for the listeners so they can have it. What's what's the title of the book? The title of the book is Civil War Captain and His Lady: Love, Courtship, and Combat from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg Campaign. Now, much longer title. I always joke with people that my idea, because it's a Civil War courtship, was I wanted it to be Fifty Shades of Blue and Gray, but <laughs> nice. the publisher didn't want to do that. <laughs> I think it would have sold like gold. It, it would have, but think about the people bought this on Amazon. Wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> right. what's, what's the blue That's and gray? hysterical. Exactly. Oh, man. I wish they would have let you do it, though. Uh, that been... well, yeah, I said that to them as well, and, and Ted just laughed. And we might have to make a segment on our Instagram or something where it's 50 shades of blue and gray <laughs> there you go feel yeah, free to, to use love it. stories from the civil war feel free to use it uh, yeah well um well thank you so much Absolutely. for joining us thank today thank you for the invite i greatly yes enjoyed sir this. yes sir and um this. is there anything uh, big coming up on your horizon i know i know you said you're you're semi-retired i'm semi-retired i'm doing some work for the gettysburg foundation they have a leadership program i'm on the faculty there i'm i'm doing a little bit of advisory work still for the state chamber where i was president for a number of years and then a couple months i'm you know 
going to be going back in and doing a little more consulting on public policy issues. Okay, well, very good. Yeah. Any any thoughts of writing another book in the future? Maybe I got something on on POW. I'm trying to get more of the primary source material. So very oh cool. man, we'll see how that goes. Listen, very you cool. talk about an area of the Civil War mm-hmm. that's just brutal. It's Horrible. And Andersonville and all. Even 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 some of the camps up north are Elmira, rough too. Camp Douglas. There were some ugly ones in the north too. Uh, Absolutely. If you if you uh, start working on it, please let us know. I will. We want to we want to get on the pre order list if we can. I'll absolutely do that. <laughs> absolutely do that. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank Manny. you guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, make sure you never miss new ones by subscribing to the show on your podcast app of choice. And if you want to help us out with growing the show and enable us to bring you better content and more of it. And Brett and I ask you leave us a five-star rating and a review. They really go a long way in helping us out. Stay up to date with everything from America Fog of War by connecting with us on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. As always, Brett and I thank you for listening. And until next time, stay frosty.